Sahil graduated from college in, in 2017 uh, and has been working with Google for four years. Um, he started looking into direct equity investments because mutual uh, fund investing wasn't intellectually satisfying for him. He felt like it was a black box and um, would rather have better foresight and uh, understanding around his investments. Uh, he's been uh, investing a large percentage of his capital himself for about two years now um, and has been really, really active on Twitter, has uh, amassed close to a following of about 20,000 followers. Um, hopefully, by the end of this session, he'll be at uh, much closer to 20,000 than he was when he began this session. Um, that being said, uh, I think I've I've also uh, seen and learned from a bunch of his tweets, uh, you know, all across um, investing. And uh, it's it's my um, absolute pleasure to welcome him here as a guest, uh, co-hosting this session with uh, Delhi Investors Association. So, hi, Sahil. Uh, welcome to the to the platform, and it's absolutely great to have you here. Hi, Krishna. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. So, so let's let us let us get started. I mean, you you spoke about you know mutual funds being a black box. So now that you've been direct investing for a while, what have you learned about stock picking? Uh, that's that's helped you build a portfolio that's very different from what a mutual fund would build. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I think there are a lot of factors uh, to consider here. Uh, one aspect of you know mutual funds is that they are generally really large players. Uh, a lot of them are like 1,000 crore AUM, 10,000 crore AUM. And at that kind of uh, size, it's very hard for them to invest into undiscovered companies. Uh, so what ends up happening is that uh, also another f fascinating thing about mutual funds is because users are looking at, you know, last six months, one year returns. So mutual funds are also sort of forced to go into momentum plays because everyone wants to gather EUM. That's how they get fees. And so, you know, they are basically chasing momentum. Uh, and there's a bunch of literature around this. Uh, but uh, what I absolutely would love to invest in is a company that hardly anyone knows about. Most people don't agree with their investment thesis uh, because probably they might not have studied about the company. And uh, by by doing deep research, we are able to create an edge there and uh, be able to own that company. Would you say that RACL GearTech was one of uh, is one example of such a company? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I would say outside of a niche set of people, like people who are uh, really, really active on value picker, people who have done a lot of deep research. Uh, most people would not have known about it. Even if they knew about it, they would not have had the conviction unless they have done that deep research to, you know, take a large bet. So, so just for the benefit of the audience, when you discover a new idea, uh, how, how does the process work? Do you look? Uh, do you primarily search through screeners? Do you primarily uh, uh, search through uh, corporate announcements, or do you look through social media? What's your process like? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I think this is one of the most important aspects of investing, which is like how do we generate ideas, right? And I think there are like multiple places. The first thing is we have to be really open-minded. Uh, we can't go into any kind of, you know, uh, like fixed mindsets that, oh, this is high PE, I can't invest, or the ROCE is negative, the return ratios are negative, it's not profit-making, I can't invest. It's really important to have an open mind. Uh, with that being said, there are multiple ways. One of them is screener for sure, especially in that period of, you know, March to June 2020, where there was a lot of pessimism. You could actually get a lot of good investing opportunities directly on screener. Because nobody wanted to own equity. People were selling equity and get out, getting out, right? And that's 
exactly how I found Aris here there. Uh, but apart from that, another thing that I've found to be really, really interesting, important is to track investors that you consider to be good capital allocators uh, and be able to independently research into positions that they are taking. For example, there's Malabar funds. Uh, there is uh, this really uh, like important but relatively small investor called Ayush Mittal. Uh, so, you know, all of these investors we track closely. We look at companies they are getting into and then try to understand what their thesis might have been. If we are able to understand, then it makes sense to invest. Otherwise, it doesn't. Yeah, you know, really interesting that you mentioned uh, Ayush Mittal because I was reading through your AMA. Uh, right before, uh, right before our Twitter conversation, and and I saw, uh, I saw that you had mentioned, um, you know, uh, Dr. Jeevan Patwa and uh, and Samit Vartak, who who also happen to be people that I've learned a lot from. But I think the first time I came across Ayush Mittal's name uh, was on uh, was on that AMA thread, and he seems to be associated with Screener, right? Yeah, I mean Ayush is actually one of the you know, most fascinating investors I've seen. Uh, the, the the thing is, you know, there are investors of all sizes. Like, you know, I'm obviously a very small investor. And, you know, Jeevan sir and uh, uh, Samit Vartak sir are really, really big investors. Uh, Ayush is, I would say, somewhere in the middle. That is really good for us because uh, if we put in enough hard work, if you are willing to work hard enough, we can actually directly talk to him. I can't imagine getting that opportunity with Samit sir, but with Ayush sir, I can actually have a conversation with him and get his thoughts. Uh, and, you know, Ayush is actually associated with 100 baggers. Like, basically, that's his like, claim to fame. If you Google for Ayush Mittal, you'll get so many articles about how he has found multiple 100 baggers. So, he's like a micro-cap, inve- a micro-cap investor. He also created Screener and a really prolific contributor on Value Picker. Fascinating. So, uh, is there is there any particular investment or story or... Uh something that Ayush Mittal did that inspired you as an investor? Yes, absolutely. There are actually, you know, so many of them. Uh, There's this company called uh, Polymedicure. There's a company called Ajanta Pharma. Essentially, what, what, you know, uh, at this point, it's important to call out that, you know, like all of these people put tremendous amount of effort. For example, there are these companies that don't do any con calls. Now, how do you get to know about those companies? Ayush, sir, is extremely dedicated. He visits their factories and their AGMs in person and, you know, tries to understand what the edge of that company is. So, you know, th- all of that legwork really shows in his returns and uh, all his multi baggers, right? And there are like multiple examples of that kind, like I said, Polymedicure. Uh, Ajanta Pharma, uh, I think very recently, RSL Gear Tech, Fixed Transmissions. All of these are companies that, like, I only read about them on Value Picker, but Ayush sir had done so much groundwork first uh, so that people like me could then, like, basically sit at home and benefit from it. That's amazing. Uh, is is Cuttlebutt or on ground work a part of your um, uh, invest, uh, investment process? Uh, so what happens with, you know, Scuttlebutt is there are like two aspects to this. Uh, first, I think is, uh, let's say there's a plant in Bangalore, right? For me to even fly down to Bangalore, it would be at least a 10,000, 12,000 rupee trip, right? And uh, it only makes sense if you have a certain portfolio size or you have a bunching of opportunities, maybe, you know, 20 companies to visit. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So I think like essentially it's only when you are an investor of a certain size, you have a portfolio of a certain size where it makes sense to do that. I would love to do that, but I don't think I'm there yet. Like in terms of, you know, it doesn't make sense for me. Other other most important part is I actually have a day job. So it's incredibly, incredibly hard to get time to, you know, just visit a factory and all of that. But at the same time, it is definitely important. So what right now I do is I rely on investors that I trust. They are sort of my eyes and feet on the ground. And you know I try to see if they can help in any way. That's awesome. Um, can, you, can you tell me a little bit about how you manage your time between, between your full day job and investing? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think on that front, like... Uh, If you carefully analyze, all of us have a lot of time in a day. Uh, We sleep for roughly eight hours and then there's 16 hours that we have, right? And with a day job, it's typically around eight hours. 
thankfully now thanks to work from home there is no travel there's a lot of time that we have like 8 plus 8 you're still left with 8 hours even if you take out 4 hours for uh, sort of watching tv or any kind of relaxing there's still 4 hours left but that's exactly what i do i try to spend at least 2 to 3 hours a day and hopefully nearer to 4 hours a day uh, on essentially investing uh, i think I, I, different things work for different people for me what really works well is having a kind of a routine uh, I, i try to you know sort of stick to that routine and dedicate 2 to 3 hours at least every day that's pretty cool so now let, let's let's go, uh, spend a little bit more time trying to understand how you look at uh, portfolio allocation and portfolio creation so when when you look at building a, a portfolio uh, are you a concentrated investor or a diversified investor how does your portfolio look i i think it's important to find like the right balance and i i don't think there's like a globally correct answer it's like we have to ask ourselves what we are comfortable with there are people that would own 50 companies and so forth for me i think what works best is uh, you know 12 to 15 companies and uh like sort of head heavy meaning the top position might have 15 20% then the next one might have 10 15% and so on and so forth so right now that's how it is it's around 14 15 companies with like 50% might be the top 3 to 4 5 companies something like that that that's pretty interesting and um, and do, uh, are there like particular themes that you're betting on because i i read in your ama that you spoke that you know your uh, you're bullish on on digital and that reflects maybe to some extent even in your portfolio so how how do you look at themes uh, when it comes to investing yeah i think i think that's a really good question and like uh, i i've said this once on twitter so i firmly believe this which is that i think like moats and uh, competitive advantages are overrated versus tailwinds which are slightly underrated because what happens is when you're part of a humongous trend uh, it's very likely that you will do decently if not uh, miraculously great right so uh, we definitely don't i mean at least i don't want to invest in companies which are facing headwinds which are sort of in a sunset industry and so forth for sure at the same time uh, i want to focus on you know bottom up uh, fundamental analysis so it's not like you know i need to own a ev company or something like that if there's a ev company which is you know competitive in its space and has good valuation and has good growth then i'm happy to own it i would only want to own companies which have those tailwinds but at the same time i would not you know try to do a top down allocation which is like okay 30% to ev 20% to renewable not like that yeah i i think i completely agree with you there i, I mean I, i i sort of follow a, a very similar approach where i look for you know top down teams um, that that are that are really working for me uh, another very interesting thing i found in your thread about rcl geotech was that you were screening for companies between 50 crores and 3000 crores is that your universe of investment uh, not always like i i have many different screeners uh, but but uh, like what i have found over time is that essentially the smaller the companies the higher are the chances of there being mis- mispricing or sort of uh, like essentially the investment universe might not have discovered that company uh, so finding those companies where you can get like that twin engine of earnings growth and pe re-rating i think it's much easier in micro caps and small caps so i i do spend a lot of time looking there by the same time i'm more than happy to invest in mid caps as well if i see good growth and low valuations there that's that's um, i think i think again you know i i kind of agree there because um I, at the end of the day if you want to get returns over you know 30 35% which is what i saw that you marked out in 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 your own uh, twitter poll uh about uh about returns over the next 5 years and you said maybe 30 35% um over the over the next 5 years and uh, and 25 30% uh after that so i think uh, yeah it's it is important to a certain extent to be able to have both engines running um and uh, and then 
being able to generate you know those outsized returns so again again let me uh, take you back a little bit to like company analysis and um, when you look at a company what would you say makes a company good or what would you say makes a company great and do you think that there's a difference between good and great companies and if yes what would that be Yeah, we lost uh, Sahil there. He's he's going. Uh, I'm just inviting him back. Yes sir were you able to hear the question I think I got disconnected in the middle don't don't worry man this keeps happening because yeah. uh, I think Twitter spaces become less glitchy now but we've had some crazy disconnects before Yeah Yeah so my question was about um, uh, about uh, good companies versus great companies and Do you look at in uh, do you look at companies that way where and where in certain companies are good and certain companies are great and if yes then how do you differentiate between them Thanks I think that's a again a great question uh, so I I definitely you know prefer to invest in companies that have some durable competitive advantages and essentially if you study a lot of companies you will start figuring out some patterns for these kind of advantages for example one pattern of success is a company which is dominant in one niche and then expanding to a related niche uh, companies that are dominant in india that are expanding globally and successfully expanding globally not just you know planning to but rather executing well on it uh, companies that are successful in one chemistry venturing into other related chemistries so you know there are these patterns of success another pattern would be uh, having prestigious clients that's like one uh, you know pattern which i've seen so many times with in like rajshri rscl uh, so essentially what what we have seen is there are these companies which are really hard to get into the supply chain of for example bmw or kuboto or uh, hul and if these 100 crore top line companies are able to get into the supply chain of these companies there must be something that they are doing right and that is what we have to figure out like how is it that this 100 crore micro cap company is able to get into the supply chain of bmw so there are patterns of success you know i'm trying to look for those patterns of success and also over time trying to build that repertoire or that uh, like that uh, set of you know patterns of success that i'm looking for uh, and uh, yeah to be honest not very interested in owning good companies but i would say there are exceptions so if i'm able to find that there are tremendous tailwinds and i can see that there will be multiple winners then i think it makes sense to own a good company for example i would say mastic is a good company it's not a great company it's not a you know does like in general in it services i think it's very hard to have you know a lot of differentiation uh, but what we could see is they are into digitization 70 80% revenue from digitization digitization is a tremendously booming space right now and at a global level at a global level digitization is growing growing in double digits that's like unheard of because the global economy is growing in at 3 to 
So if a global uh, industry is going growing in double digits, it's very very likely that you know, like like I was saying, rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, tailwinds are underrated. Digitization is one such tailwind, and I would say like you know, if there are let's say 30 companies that are into digitization in the IT space, probably 25 of them will create wealth. So I, I looked at some other things and I thought that you know, mass tech made sense. But so that's an example of a good company. Uh, but definitely, I would prefer to invest in great companies if I can get them at good valuations. And and you and you would say that uh, um, RACL and uh, PIX are great companies. Absolutely. And one thing we have to keep in mind is that you know we can't compare a hundred crore, two hundred crore PIX to like a uh, you know let's say ten thousand crore HUL. That would not be a fair comparison. We would have to look at companies of that size. And, you know, how was HUL as a company or HDFC Bank as a company when they were that small? So is it exhibiting similar patterns of success? That is another place where I absolutely love the Value Picker Forum because you can actually see the journey of many companies, you know, from being that small niche micro cap to being a dominant player. For example, PI Industries, Astral Pipes. Both of these are companies that Value Picker found probably before anyone else. And you can read through its 10, 12 year history, you know, when it was a 100 crore company and how it has now become a 10,000, 30,000 crore company market cap and how that journey has panned out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think I could agree more. Um, in fact, um, le let me ask you a slightly more difficult question. Okay. Um, and, th and this one's uh, around corporate governance. So do you feel like, um, you know, um, smaller companies can be or should be uh, not held to the same kind of standards that, uh, that a company 10 or 20 times its size would be held by? Yeah, again, uh, that's a wonderful question. I think like what we have to again focus on here is identifying patterns of success. Uh, so first things first, I don't think corporate governance is like a yes or no or a Boolean or a binary. It's a spectrum. Everyone is somewhere on that spectrum. Nobody is a dood ka dula. I'm sure if I try hard enough, I can find dirt on any company on earth. Uh, so with that in mind, what kind of companies are we looking at? We're looking at companies that A, are great for their size. B, they're moving in the right direction. I think that is where the highest amount of money is made in that delta. And there are so many examples of that. For example, if you look at APL Apollo, they have had a checkered past, but they actually, you know, cleaned their books. They brought in the, I think, one of the top four uh, auditing firms. Sahil, I don't think I can hear you anymore. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll invite you back again. I I was saying that you know that APL Apollo is one such example. Uh, we can find many such examples where essentially what we can see is the corporate governance is moving in the right direction. Another thing that we have to keep in mind is that uh, like generally a company is like a movie. It's not a static photo. So we have to evaluate it as a movie. Another example that uh, my friend Ishmohit always gives is of Haikal. Where, you know, at some point they didn't do good disclosures. Uh, Ishmohit had studied it for two to three years, but he couldn't invest into it. But then they started giving good disclosures. And at that point, he decided, you know, that the facts are changing. So I need to change my opinions. And he decided to invest. I think we have to be very open minded here. We can't form these like, you know, uh, here or there kind of opinions that no, no, this company is untouchable. It's bad and things like that. Fair point, fair point. Again, you know, I, I tend to agree with you a lot. Uh, I'm noticing because uh, all, a lot of the examples that you've given, uh, APL, Apollo, uh, Mastec and... Uh, and Heikel are all companies that I've invested in. Um, 
I think this is the perfect time to give a disclaimer that anything that we discuss here is not investment advice. Please do your own research before investing in any of these companies. We may have taken positions or we may currently have positions or we may currently have not. And we may have taken these positions at very, very different periods of time. Uh, so, yeah, um, with that with that out of the way, I'm, I'm going to um, also ask you another question. So, with APL Apollo, a, a very interesting thing that, that happened was that uh, um, they, they became, you know, uh, market leaders. They have 50% of the market share. And now they've gone into sort of innovating in their own um, in their own way and creating this really crazy product mix. So uh, my question is, where do you look for these, you know, non-financial insights? Because you won't find this just in like, you know, uh, studying the balance sheet or or studying the PNL and and also, uh, you know, e- even even if you were to like, you know, l- listen um, to what you know. Uh, analysts have to say about the company you may not be able to catch these smaller finer details so what would be a place that you'd look for uh, if you wanted to get you know this um, kind of business alpha absolutely that's again a great question and uh, uh, i i think i want to add a couple of points to this uh, first is conference calls you know like anyone that wants to do active investing must listen to read conference calls whichever you prefer, either read or listen. Uh, conference calls, why? Because investors like you and I then ask the management these same questions that, you know, what what gives you that advantage? How are you able to do this? How are you able to reduce your working capital cycle? How are you able to create these innovative brands and so on and so forth? That's the first point. Second point, what I've seen is uh, a lot of these are driven by extremely passionate entrepreneurs. So what happens is these entrepreneurs are very passionate about their business, which means they actually speak at many forums about their business and their journey and how they have crafted those businesses. So one thing I would always do for a company is sort of YouTube for its founder uh, or for the company, any interviews, any forums where they have spoken and try to understand, you know, what that uh, advantage is. For example, since you took APL Apollo, there is this one YouTube video. I'll try to find it, but I think it was one of the AGMs. Or, or I think it was like a like a uh, meet of APL Apollo with its distributors. So that thing is on YouTube. And essentially what uh, the MD says is that uh, earlier APL Apollo used to be a push brand or rather a push company. That means that they had to push their products to the distributors and to the users. Now they have become a pull company meaning that the users are coming and asking for APL Apollo products. And that is now giving them pricing power. That is giving them working capital power. Because they are like, if if you want our products, we will give it to you on our terms. And that's how they're able to, you know, really good, uh, like reduce their working capital cycle. Uh, sort of, uh, I think, like at least tricode part is negative working capital cycle. I think even APL Apollo, they are trying to make into negative working capital. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I think it'll be an interesting trigger to see how that uh, how APL Apollo is as a company with negative working capital. Um, you know, uh, I'm I'm also interested in uh, in in understanding uh, when you find a, a a great company versus a good company. Th- does your allocation depend on that or? What are the factors sort of guiding your allocation? Because you spoke about the head of your portfolio having, uh, you know, far more concentration than the tail of your portfolio. So, yes, that's a good point. I think there are like two or three different aspects to allocation. Uh, Allocation by itself, you know, deserves like a thousand tweet thread. And in that thousand tweets, 500 tweets would be on valuation. So if I have to talk about allocation, I have to talk about valuation. Essentially, all of it comes down to the following. How much return do I expect from this position in the future? And how much is the volatility in my estimate? Let's say I'm expecting 30%. But in the bear case, I expect minus 30%. And in the bull case, I expect 100%. Right? That means there's a lot of volatility. I can either lose big or I can win big. I would probably not want to allocate too much capital to this position. Whereas if the downside is limited 
I'm able to get in at a valuation where either nobody loves the company or nobody understands the company or nobody has discovered the company. One of those three. But I can see that the company has competitive advantages. Then I'm able to, you know, size it large. Another point I want to make is, um, especially since I am a working individual, I've only been working for four four years. My annual savings are significant compared to the portfolio. What that means is I can never say that, okay, now I'm done with my allocation. I can't allocate more. At every point, every month, I have to allocate more to every position. What that means is for me, position building is always like a movie. Again, it's not like, okay, I'm done. And now, now I don't have to allocate. It's more like, you know, every month I have to figure out, you know, where is the best risk reward for me? Very, very interesting. So you spoke about the the aspect around, you know, uh, sort of return expectations from, from each company. Now, while there are, you know, common ways of figuring out what the return expectation could be in terms of, you know, management guidance being one, uh, CapEx being another one. But what about companies, um, you know, in the uh, in the IT segment or what about companies like, uh, you know, uh, Angel One, which is in your portfolio, which have a cyclical element to it? How do you look at companies like that? So I think there are like, uh, you, you brought up a great point, which is like, how do we do that, right? How do we do that calculation? Um, and every calculation is effectively a combination of two elements. The first is how much growth we expect in the fundamentals, in, in either in the top line or a bottom line. And secondly, what kind of like exit multiples would we be able to give to the company? Um Effectively, it's a combination of that. If you're doing DCF, it's it's equivalent to that because in DCF, your variable is how many years of growth there will be. And, uh, you know, that effectively sort of dictates what your exit multiple is because uh, that's sort of the terminal value of the company. So what I'm saying is that, you know, effectively in every... Oops, I think we lost him again. Let's just wait and see uh, if he comes back. <laughs> it's it's cool. It's cool. That's why we we've set up two co-hosts so that you know, in case disconnections happen anywhere, we we always have the ability to keep the room running. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So we lost you at effectively. Uh, what I was saying is that, you know, effectively DCF and, uh, you know, essentially a exit multiple kind of thing, both are very equivalent to each other. Essentially, what the investor is trying to figure out is, A, how much growth in fundamentals will I get over the horizon of my investment? And B, how much growth can the company give beyond that? Because that is what decides the exit multiple or the terminal value, however you want to see. You can say that the company will grow its earnings at 20% for seven years, and then I can exit at a multiple of 30. Now, that can only happen if the if at that point after seven years, someone is willing to give it 30 multiple. That can only happen if at that point they see either longevity or some decent amount of growth. My point is, essentially, it's all about growth forecasting, right? So then how do we forecast this growth? I think there are, like uh, like you said, we have different inputs that should go into our mental model. The, like you said, there's CAPEX guidance. Uh, uh, there is end user growth, like uh, industry growth. How much is the industry growing? Um, but I think the most important thing is first to figure out, is the management giving a guidance? Second, to figure out, in general, does the management walk the talk or do they not walk the talk? You can find so many managements who will guide for X and then under deliver. On the other hand, you will also find many managements who guide for X and then deliver something more than that. So I think that's very important because there are managements who are very conservative. There are managements who are very aggressive. There are managements who will say that I will make the top line 5X in the, in the next five years. Maybe, but you know, it's very hard. Uh, you know, it's not easy for any company to grow 5X in five years. So we have to be very skeptical about those. I, I, I've seen so many companies of that kind, which are like, okay, I can grow 10x in the next two years. And then investors are happy to jump in. I would say, you know, that's a dangerous thing to do. You have to figure out, is the management capable of walking the talk? Firstly. Secondly, 
what kind of guidance are they giving thirdly do we actually see any triggers that can help them achieve that or like where is that growth going to come from are they good doing capex is there good demand do we see some sort of a plan now to come to your examples right uh, angel angel has actually said at many many places that they are effectively going to grow at 26% that is what they have said we can look at their past track record we can also see that they are sitting on 1000 crores of cash which they are planning to use to do an acquisition in the next year or so in the machine learning data analytics space in the us diversify their revenues we can also see that they already did one such acquisition which is evosys and that already helped them a lot we can also see in the latest interview i think it happened a couple of days ago where what what the ceo said is we have evaluated 50 candidates for uh, acquisition they have also said in their con calls that we don't just look for the numbers we want a good fit for the culture we want a company which sort of plugs a gap in our own portfolio of services that we provide so i think essentially it's about you know being able to sort of gauge that do i trust what they are saying are they likely to deliver have they done it in the past you know questions like that that's exactly the reason why let's say a capsule maker says i'm going to make apis now that makes me skeptical like can they do that most certainly they can but would i be willing to invest my hard earned money to bet that they will do it probably not yeah make make sense completely just just wanted one clarification you started talking about angel and then you sort of moved over to mastech and uh, so the 26% guidance that you spoke about was that for angel was that for mastech uh, sorry sorry for that i think the 26% guidance is for mastech mastech has talked about doubling their revenues in the next 3 years in a in a few different places and they have also said once in their annual reports that like digitization itself is growing at 20% and we will grow faster than industry so then they, they have made many such sort of you know uh, like pointing towards the fact that they want to double in 3 years they have directly said it but they have said it in like different ways in many different places i think the latest one fy21 they have clearly said that we are going to double the top line in 3 years but i think that's the first time like you won't find it in any concourse it's only in the fy21 annual report now coming back to angel so you are absolutely right angel is actually one of those companies where it's like extremely hard to build in like a 5 year view or even a 3 year view with angel i think what we have to figure out is a couple of different aspects right what are the key variables which will decide the success or failure of angel and i i think i said this once on twitter but like it bears repeating to me personally angel is just a play on small cap and mid cap space doing well if i am a small cap and mid cap investor if i have put all of my money in small cap and mid cap putting money in angel is a natural extension of that it's nothing out of the ordinary uh, can you explain uh, how how that logic works is it, is it because like if small caps and mid caps do well then capital markets do well and then angel does well Yeah yeah I said I I was asking about uh, about how did you make that uh, you know um, that connection between small and mid caps and and angel was it because um, you know if uh, small and mid caps do well capital markets do well therefore angel does well Yeah essentially what you can find is there is high correlation between what the FNO activities futures and options and in uh, you know small and mid cap space rallying uh and thus you know capital markets uh, like you said but but essentially like what we have seen at least in the last few years is large caps effectively always do well there are very short drawdowns like march 2020 i would say even De- december 2008 was a relatively short drawdown it's it's only in the small and mid cap where you see these large corrections another thing to keep in mind is i made that investment in angel when we were coming out of like a three year bear market in small and mid caps now just think in terms of probabilities is it is it more likely that at least for a couple of years we won't have a bear market in small and mid caps or is it more likely that we will have a bear market in small and mid caps i think the answer is like probability wise it's more likely we won't because we are just coming out of it and we have good macro tailwinds for example capex pli uh, china plus 1 i can go on and on 
GST formalization. You look at anything, and we are growing essentially. So to me, it felt like a low risk kind of thing. Another thing I want to mention is: uh, is the company conscious about its own cyclicality, and what is it doing to break that cyclicality? In Angel, we can see that yes, it is conscious. and it is trying to focus on that they have said that they are going to apply for an amc license and not just yet another amc but rather a differentiated amc and algorithmic amc so we can see that you know they are moving in the right direction yeah uh, I, i i totally agree and and uh, would you say that your uh, would your your thesis is that uh, before we see a real drawdown in the in the small and mid cap um they will have achieved some of that diversification because i'm assuming that when you get into these investments you also think about how you want your exit to be i i think with angel it was more the risk reward like i think it was around maybe 18 times trailing earnings and you could see that it's extremely hard for there to be if for there to not be like a year of growth a year of growth would sort of double their profits or something maybe 50 60 time percent the profits would go up effectively you were buying it at like a 8 to 10 pe or something right uh, one year forward and that valuation it makes all the sense and by the way when i bought angel it had already gone up something like 100% or maybe 60% but you could see that it's still cheap so that's why you know we can't get anchored to the price something like even rscl right it was when i entered it was at 5 pe even after rising 100% it could still have been at 10 pe i would say for the quality of company we have 10 pe is not very expensive so even at 10 pe i allocated a lot more so yeah and uh, I- i'm also i'm also curious because you spoke about you know uh, if you find two or three good ideas in a year uh you're happy so is that the level of churn you look at in your portfolio that's a great point i think that the level of churn in the portfolio is a function of the stock market actually because when you are in a very very depressed stock market you have so many ideas and like let's take an example right uh there's this company called polymedicure what i would urge all your listeners to do is to open its screener page and look at how it's revenues have been growing for the last 10 years or so right uh there's this thing called sales and margin uh go to sales and margin look at it from march of 2005 from march of 2005 it has effectively had a quarter on quarter growth like for something like 17 years or something that's crazy right just look at the sort of the certainty in earnings like how much certainty is there quarter on quarter growth for like 17 years right this is almost like google or uh, amazon or microsoft this company this polymedicure and it's a very concentrated industry if you if you sort of try to study it they're into uh, medical consumables if you study this industry uh, this company was available at a pe of 30 or something they are consistently growing at 15% huge opportunity size because we actually import most of these medical instruments consumables polymedicure is just getting started so at 15% uh, top line growth for i would say a decade is like easy 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 this was obviously very undervalued like if you if you are happy to buy hul at 70 80 pe polymedicure at 30 made all the sense in the world so i invested into polymedic but then what happened is it went up so fast it ended up reaching something like 70 80 90 pe so that then the risk reward does not make sense to me because Are, am I happy paying a 90 PE for a company growing 15% top line, 20% bottom line for 10 years? Not really. Like I can find so many better opportunities. So at that point, I had to sell it and then buy another company. And a similar case happened with Sequence Scientific. When I entered Sequence Scientific, very similar story. It had like 30 or so PE. And then I, when when I you know at some point around 300 rupees, it was maybe 70, 80 PE. Again, to me, it didn't make sense. You know, a company growing at 15%. You are giving it seventy eighty PE. So then I again I exited it and I invested my money somewhere else. So to answer your question, churn is a function of alternate opportunities I have. Now here I want to bring up a very important point, which is when I am selling one position, where am I going to put that money? Is a equally important decision. We cannot look at sell as a uh, individual uh, decision. When you are selling, you need to know what you are going to do with that money. 
if you're going to invest it into a second company, you have to visualize how that moves your portfolio. Like, let's take an example, right? I have three API companies, let's say hypothetically. Uh, I only have two right now, but let's assume that I have three. I'm, let's say I'm selling a bank and I'm putting that com- money into another API company, a fourth API company. I think that's actually, you know, increasing the risk of my portfolio. Because if for any reason China plus one does not play out, then my portfolio is at a higher risk, right? So I would actually, you know, very, very carefully think about every incremental company that I'm adding. What is it going to add to my portfolio in terms of the diversification of the cash flows of the portfolio? I should think of my portfolio as like I am a holding company. My holding company has 15 companies in it. Am I willing to exchange company number seven for company number 16 and keep my level of risk, which is, you know, I I don't want to add a fourth API company, you know, something like that. So, I mean, uh, that's a very long winded answer, but essentially, you know, depending on the opportunities, I'm happy to churn. I mean, to me, churn is a like, uh, Churn is not a bad word. I'm happy to churn every day if I can find a better opportunity. Let's say I buy a company today, it doubles tomorrow, and I find a better company tomorrow. Then I'll churn tomorrow. And I'll do this 365 days a year if I can find 100% return 365 days a year. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's that's a very prudent approach because uh, what I've seen as well in my own portfolio this year has been that... Uh, companies uh, that have uh, you know really skyrocketed at certain points they've become really mad expensive and then then the risk reward just doesn't make sense um i'll wait for you to reconnect uh, yeah so so i was saying that uh, you know um uh, I, I've I've sort of seen the same thing happen with my portfolio this year, wherein um, uh, wherein companies ha- that that have had you know tailwinds have really really run up, um, and then it it makes a lot of sense to then reevaluate the the risk return there. Absolutely. You also brought up a uh, please go please go. You also brought up a really interesting point around. Uh, uh, around risk through concentration in in particular sectors so is there like a threshold um, say like a 15 20 percent or 25 percent threshold that in this particular idea say apis or any other theme that i won't cross this this level yeah for sure i mean the i, I would say you know it's like the problem with having thresholds is it gives us a sense of you know false precision like, okay, I have a number in my mind now. But the question would be, how did you arrive at that number? So I would say like, it's not hard and fast rules, but rather like the direction. With every incremental churn, I want to make my portfolio stronger. So again, a concrete example I can give here is Web of Global. I actually don't expect too much returns from it. Uh, it, it might grow top line at 15%, bottom line at 20%. That's like my base case right now. Then why am I invested in Web of Global? Because actually it's present in a space that none of my other companies are present in. You can think of it this way that every other company might be on like the x-axis of a plane. Web of Global is like the y-axis of the plane. It's providing that diversification of cash flows. So I'm happy to invest even with a 20% uh, return expectation. Pretty pretty interesting point. So uh, besides sector level diversification, um, what are some other factors you keep in mind, both on the stock level and on the portfolio level, when it comes to risk? Uh, hmm. So I think I think most important part, which I haven't yet spoken about, is margin of safety. Uh, my sort of bias from the school from which I come, whatever I've read, books, uh, value picker, investors and all, is that there has to be a margin of safety in your investment. I am not generally very happy to pay a 300 PE for a company. I'm probably the biggest fanboy of Elon Musk and Tesla that you can find, but I'm not going to be a shareholder of Tesla because the risk reward is not in my favor and the margin of safety is not there. It might have been there four years ago, five years ago, but today it's not there. So I think margin of safety, really, really important uh, concept. Second most important concept, the quality of the company, which you talked about earlier, right? And this is something which I've seen, which sort of makes me a bit, you know, sad. Uh, even investors that I have a lot of respect for, 
in my humble opinion are going down the value curve now as the bull market is progressing so you know people are thinking that this company is at 70 pe the other one is at 8 let me buy the company at 8 pe we need to ask ourselves why is it at 8 pe because you can't always be a contrarian and succeed you have to be a contrarian and you have to be correct that's the important thing if you're going to invest in a low quality company that's uh, again a tweet i had a few days ago that like you know if you're going if i if i'm going to sell rcl and rashree uh, and then buy some optically uh, undervalued company that's like cutting my flowers and using them as a manure for the weed so you know that's another risk right because we we tend to do that we will look at let's say a sare gama and we'll say okay this is overvalued i'm going to sell sare gama and we'll say let's buy philips carbon black it's at 8 pe it's a you know uh, uh, like a specialty chemical or something and i'll buy it philips carbon but you know i i think that's a very risky decision we have to be very 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 careful with those kind of decisions some great points you brought up there as far as risk is concerned um and you also mentioned you know um, around around tesla and um, and obviously you have google stock because you you work for google but but you also have etsy so i i wanted to ask one why is etsy the only other stock in your portfolio and two how are you looking at inter- international diversification yeah i think with etsy the thing is like i wanted to own etsy uh i had it uh, a small kind of a position not a very large one but i was actually taught a very interesting lesson in the last few like months right if you look at how the tech basket has moved the us tech basket essentially everything has crashed it's been like a everything crash if you look at the tech basket and you know etsy has not been a, a exception so i was sort of taught a lesson in that which is that you know you can't again like like i was saying uh, it it's almost like i was ignoring my own advice uh, you know i was happy to buy etsy at 220 dollars let's say uh, pe of like 60 or something i thought that you know it will grow into that pe you know i buy it at 220 um it's going to grow 30 40% every year and maybe 2 to 3 years down the line it actually won't look that expensive anymore that's what i thought but then what we saw is that uh, in this kind of a crash it literally fell by like you know 20 30 40% so one thing i've observed over time is that uh, you know paying up for growth is a risky thing the reason is a lot of these tech companies have become essentially momentum investments for people right their fair value does not matter everyone wants in on the game they don't care about the valuation they are going to buy it but what happens when the macro risks come up right for example uh, fed the us fed is going to sort of increase the interest rates which means that you know the people who want like uh, who want to take lesser risks are going to take money out of equity put it into the american uh, bonds and so forth so i think with etsy i think like the company is doing great but at the same time i am not that you know confident about my uh, investment as a whole because the valuation is again nose bleed uh, i i wanted to own it but the recent crash made me feel like that was probably a mistake on my part uh, in fact i'm going to talk about that also sometime very soon on twitter pretty cool uh I I mean I think it's um it, it's a pretty important uh, insight to have about um, uh, about how the, uh, certain companies can turn into these momentum plays when when we, when we think of them uh, less like companies that generate cash flow and more like collectibles to have in our investment portfolio. Yeah, yeah. It, it, um so i'm i'm guessing you're not very into on the whole like uh, newly listed tech space in india as well you you can say that like what i have done is uh, i have taken a bet against myself like 2 to 3% of the portfolio is invested in these like newly listed companies which i feel have a very strong uh, competitive advantage one is nika the other is sona comstar uh, third is tatva chintan again i have tried to want to have a you know balance of like the cash flows i don't want all my companies to be aggregators another fascinating thing you'll figure out is most of these quote unquote tech players in india are aggregators aggregators are not exactly platforms like if you compare them to facebook or google or twitter they are not really platforms so again i don't think it makes sense 
at the same time i could be wrong the only way i can maximize my learning is to have skill in the game so i take overall these three positions might be like 3 to 4% of the portfolio I, i might lose all the money but i'll learn something for sure i love that i love that um, it, and very very uh, you know powerful distinction you brought up there between platforms and aggregators because oh, essentially the difference between a zomato which which hosts all the players on its platform um uh and uh, and someone like a google is that google then owns the data that's created and that gr- data in itself has residual value um which you could say to a certain extent e- even even zomato is able to generate but they are in a sense aggregating a service and not hosting that service on their platform actually you know and i think ha uh, please go on i was just going to say and i think that's an important distinction yeah like just to add to that point right i actually thought deeply about this issue uh you know like uh, uh, what kind of quality of platforms you have uh, since you brought up like google and uh, uh, uh zomato uh, i think this one very important question which is like for the provider how easy is it to agree like sort of uh, go on to all the competing platforms and what kind of incentives do they have and like you rightly said what kind of advantages does market share give you so let's say zomato has hypothetically 60% market share amazon with all their money want to come can they come can they do a good job ask yourself that question to me the answer is an emphatic yes yes they can do a good job because you can put all that capital into discounting and you can kill zomato's profits and you can sort of uh, take all the value out of the sector everyone makes losses every- I think we'll have Sahil join back in a minute again. Right? Uh everybody has tried to build a search engine. Uh Microsoft has uh to some extent Facebook has uh dug dug go and like brave maybe a uh, brave is a uh, browser but like there are other other search engines also why can they not i think that's what investors need to ask how hard is it to replicate and is it a winner take all uh, so this is another thing that you know uh, uh, the malabar uh, investment guys were saying of like maybe a couple of days ago on bloomberg quit that you know like with the platform plays you have to ask yourself uh, is it the case that the winner actually takes all if it's the case that winner takes all then it makes a lot of sense to you know invest in these companies at sort of like any valuation because they're going to take all but is is food delivery a winner take all probably not is ride hailing a winner take all probably not because there's a like local locality factors like Indi- delhi versus bangalore versus hyderabad and so forth Yeah, makes sense. Uh, I'm, I'm now, now I'm really curious. How do you look at Nike through the same lens? So I, I think with Nike, you're absolutely right. Like I do feel that it's essentially an aggregator, right? So like I, I don't think it's a very high quality uh, platform to be very honest with you. But what Nike does have is an opportunity to go higher up the value chain. What is that opportunity? That opportunity is social comms. What will happen is. if nike can actually create this community of influencers who are selling nike products through let's say youtube tiktok instagram and uh, they have all the incentive to be on nike if most of the shoppers are on nike then it becomes a flywheel if they can actually make social commerce take off in india then they become like a true platform and it becomes very hard for anyone to come in because think of it this way like i mean sure you can actually create a video and uh, share it on nike and the other platform but nike can always ask their uh, people to make it exclusive right for example spotify asks its uh, content creators to make it exclusive 
So if, if you have like the let's say uh, Nike hypothetically, if it gets sixty percent of all consumers uh, in the market, then Nike can say, "I have the consumers. You can only put your content on my platform or the other platform." And then obviously the content creator has to choose Nike. So I think they they have that opportunity, but they are not there yet. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. Um, uh, the 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 social commerce uh, idea and it's 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 become so big in 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 other East Asian countries that it still remains a a, a, a huge market. And I think Nike is uh, quite a bit ahead of uh, you know all the other players as far as social commerce. Absolutely. Goes. With that, I think I'll I'll give I'll give this disclaimer one more time that uh, nothing we discuss here is uh, investment advice. Uh, please do your own research uh, before investing in any of these companies. Uh, and I think I'm going to ask you uh, one or two last questions, and then we can open it up to the audience. Sure, sounds good. Cool. Uh, so I I read a very interesting tweet again by you, uh, which which was around. Um, um, you know books being kind of overrated if if you don't apply that that knowledge or that uh, insight into the real world and you you cited value picker as an example of uh, of of a space where you can learn and apply uh, immediately so how do you look at books and and what value have they added in your life so far um uh, are you asking specifically for investing or in general both so you can you can differentiate between uh investing and to the rest of your life um and an answer for you sure sure uh so i mean for sure there are certain things which are like easier or better learned through books for example if you want to learn mathematics uh, the, ma- books are the best way right you find so many books on all types of math that you want to learn you want to learn calculus there are books you want to learn this thing called competitive mathematics uh, this thing called olympiads there are books you want to learn mental math or like uh, some kind of like mcq kind of math there are books for that jee there are books and so forth right and those books are really hyper optimized the reason is it's a fairly uh, rich field it's a fairly old field and it's a it's essentially math is like the queen of sciences right and uh, science is also very structured so it's it's very good to learn it through books makes a lot of sense what's very very hard to learn through books is investing in my opinion the reason is investing is one of those fields where i again quote professor bakshi the opposite of a good idea can also be a good idea so that makes it really really hard anyone can bring up anything i can bring up something opposite and both will make sense so how do you actually understand what works when does it work and so forth right uh for example buffett will say something like momentum does not make sense don't chase momentum uh you know things like that but if you read other research uh and also look at actual returns of people momentum is actually one of the strongest factors in portfolio returns even stronger than value how do we explain that right so again opposite of a good idea can also be a good idea so i think uh, what i found with investing books is that they sort of just repeat the same message over and over again buy low buy right look at roce uh, look at how the competitors how the value chain people perceive the company they're going to repeat the same thing over and over again they're going to say compounding is great everyone is going to say the same thing right it's i can probably distill down all investing books into 10 20 kind of uh, i let me take that back not all but like 90% of investing books into 10 to 20 maxims and then you're done that's it uh, you've read all the books i don't think the incremental book adds too much value which is why i was asking in that tweet can anyone actually tell me a in- investing book which adds a lot of value there are not too many actually to be honest at least not that i have found any uh, because because of the fact that you know it's it's like everybody knows what is to be done and yet they are not able to do it why is that i think there are couple of factors first one is every equity market and its returns are a function of the time in which it exists books written by americans in 1950s are not going to apply to india in 2020 that's just how reality is right our equity markets behave in a very different way as a simple example mean reversion is something all value investors swear by 
generally it does not work in india or even if it works it will underperform finding companies which are high quality finding companies which are growing growth is essentially what the market pays for in india because india is generally perceived as a growth market people don't want to buy value companies if you want to buy value companies go to japan or korea uh, my last question is about uh, is is still about books uh, have there been any any books so one two three doesn't matter how many that have really impacted your your life uh, and just the conjunction to that question is are there any books that you've read more than once uh, again you know uh, wonderful questions uh, the books that have really impacted my life and like i would say are uh, a must read for people are actually sort of more in the you know self help category uh, because uh, i think like one of the like life level objectives that at least i have is to figure out the nature of our reality like what's going on why are we here and you know things like that i think the book that i really love is this thing called power of now uh, there are many books of the same genre uh, but yeah power of now is one so there's always something else there for me to understand and learn so it's very hard for me to repeat a book yeah i mean i i totally understand and i think uh even even for me uh, probably you know there would be very few books uh you know less than 5 um uh, that 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 i would consider in that uh you know in that bucket of books which um you know i i would read a second time and i think you know just to sort of lay that perspective out there before we uh move fully into q and a Uh, i th- i think uh, it's it's very interesting because that incremental value of 10 to 20% if if it is applied in, at the exact you know at, at a portion in your life where that 10 20% can act as a lever or as a force multiplier i think only in those cases uh, you know can can a book make sense to be read twice and that's why i find it such an interesting question to to ask any of the speakers that that we have here mm. um around you know what is that book because it it has to act as some sort of lever or some sort of force multiplier for you to want to go back there and, and read it again absolutely so with that let's let's move to uh, dr deeman next uh, dr deeman you can unmute and ask your question Dr. Deeman, are you here? Am I audible? Yes, Hello? yes, you are. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Sahil. Hello. This was a very nice session. Thank you. Learned many th- many things from you. Thank you. So, can I proceed with my questions? Please, please. Uh, one thing I want to learn from you is that how to beat the market or index for long term, irrespective of bear and bull market. Let's say for two decades. So, I I think like I uh, fair disclosure, like I am probably not the right person to answer that because uh, I'm still learning on my own. like i'm still only 2 years old in terms of like uh, managing i am also a learner that's why i am asking yeah 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 i'm just putting the disclosure because like anything i say is sort of acquired knowledge i have listened to other investors so it's not my experience just putting that disclosure but with that disclosure what i've seen uh, there's this fascinating interview of uh, uh, vijay kedia sir uh, uh, for context for people who might not know vijay kedia sir i think has a portfolio of like uh, 500000 crore or even larger he's an individual investor he's like literally came from nothing and is now like a superstar investor so this is an interview of his he has many of them i listened to all of them in one of them what he says is that in the 2008 crash what happened is his position which had gone from like uh, x to 10x came back to x like 80 90% fall right cut wrenching cut wrenching x to 10x to back to x and then it went to 100x so i think that's something we have to be prepared for as a you know if you want the alpha 
you have to be prepared for the downside and that's what you will find all good investors say that if your company is executing well don't think about the price as simple as that uh, one of the best examples i can find here is sajal sir right he has such amazing insight in depth knowledge because he has this focused you know circle of competence he understands those companies so well he will probably be the last person to sell every one of us all of us chelas uh, you know people who are learning from him will learn we will own the company we will sell it when we think that we are getting quote and quote getting better opportunities i think we are making a mistake i i admit that i am making a mistake he will keep owning it and in the end he is the one that will you know then have that wonderful compounding and be able to beat the market there is a problem with us is we think we are too smart we are going to smell uh, sell it and then put it into a second company the second company will do well but i mean i don't know if it will for example i sold sequent i don't know if where i put that money is it going to do better than sequent i don't know maybe it won't and i will not do well so i think i think one thing i have understood is uh, the only way to do well in all phases of the market is to focus on earnings 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 where is the earnings does your company have earnings if the company has earnings i don't care if there is a 80% fall i would be happy like let there be a 80% fall in rscl i'll double my position i don't care about the 80% fall okay excellent answer thank you uh the next one is what's your criteria for top up that's again a great question I, the example i want to give here is sare gama so what happened is i think q3 fy21 or q4 fy21 which is like uh, either december quarter last year or march quarter last year right after that there was this con call in that con call everything i heard gave me the indication that the quality of the moat that saregama has is actually wider than i had imagined and the antithesis right. Right. antithesis is actually weaker than i what i had imagined it is so hard to breach that moat that even at that point where it almost unbreakable i can yeah. predict exactly exactly and you know essentially what happens is over time as our conviction grows as our understanding grows as our research grows that's when right. we get the you know that uh, sort of conviction that we can double down or increase the uh, allocation at the same time i also want to add that sometimes we make mistakes the example i have here is web of global so web of global again i started at 30 pe or something great company allocated lot of capital yeah, yeah. web of global ran up to like 60 to 70 pe i thought that even at this point it might make sense quality is the same uh Sorry, did we lose you? Hello. I I think we lost. Sorry, we'll have to wait till. Okay, uh, okay. I'll be waiting. No problem. No problem. It's happening. Guys, at any point, if any of you gets bumped down to the audience, just request again to come back up. I'll pull you up instantly. Yeah. Sorry. Just to quickly complete that answer, what I was saying is that you know, like uh, sometimes we make mistakes as well. we have to be very very conscious and focused on identifying those mistakes i was mistaken about web of globals you know growth acceleration of growth i thought from 15% it might start growing at 20 25% that didn't happen and the valuations collapsed all the ca- capital i allocated at 6 660 pe is sort of a bad capital allocation whereas for sare gama the growth has accelerated and all my incremental top ups have been a good capital allocation so uh, one thing i want to know uh, valuation doesn't matter to you what i mean to say suppose someone has bought saregama as 800 or as we are discussing saregama or 2000 now it's more than 4000 near by 5000 so will you invest will you top up so that's exactly what i'm saying right that the top up has to be conditioned on how i perceive the future will pan out and only if my thesis becomes stronger should i be topping up otherwise it doesn't make sense at at these valuations that is the only point that is the only point according to you yeah yeah thesis has to become stronger okay got you got you got a point yeah. uh, the another question i have is that what's your diversification in debt and other asset classes so i i, I dabbled with many different things uh, i tried liquid funds 
uh, there's this Franklin low duration fund fiasco. If any of you know, uh, they, they sort of became a bad debt. Uh, I dabbled with many things, but finally, what I realized is, I'm taking so much risk in equity. It doesn't make sense to take risk in debt. So now all of it is lying in a fixed deposit in IDFC First Bank. Now, probably my question was not uh, right. Uh, what I asked you is whether you are invested in gold or something else, bonds, something like no, that. No, no, only fixed deposits in IDFC First Bank. And that is a great answer, but you are not invested in gold or other asset classes like real estate. No, nope, no. Nope. I mean, I I'm, I have bought a home, but that's for living. That's not a financial asset. I'm not going to sell that it. Is a good yeah. okay. Thank you very much for all your answers. Thank you. Thank and you. all the best for your future. Thank you, sir. All the best for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Great luck. Thank, Thank you. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. Awesome. So with that, we will go to accidental and then Vikas after that. Hi Sahil. Hi. Thanks for the uh, knowledgeable session. My question is on valuation ke hai because uh, isme basically kya hai ki if we hear different people, everyone has a basic thing like ki malab, valuation ye hai ki you don't overpay and sell at good price. Means when aapka ya to target achieve ho gaya hai ya kahe ki overvalued ho gaya hai. But ek, jab valuation karne chalta hai, ek beginner ki agar hum baat leke chale hai, what would be the right approach to do valuation of any business? Ab sir, I aapko kya bataun? Ye to hai, ye sabse difficult question hai. Uh, I, I know ki, matlab, you know, many people talk about valuation. I don't think I'm qualified enough because it's very, very, very hard. It's not about PE, it's not about growth. It's a lot of factors. In valuation, ke, I would say I would distinguish it into two parts. First part is just the numbers. Ki matlab growth kitni hai company mein. Aaj uska sort of multiple kya mil raha market mein. And mujhe kya lagta hai ki teen char saal baad better multiple milega ya worse multiple milega. And that itself depends on ki teen char saal baad jo company dikhegi. Investor usme invest karna chahenge kitna karna chahenge. Let's take an example. Aur ye example I think uh, Samit Vartak sir ne apne kaafi sari talks mein diya. वो एक कंपनी में इन्वेस्टेड थे जिसका नाम था ला ओपाला क्या हुआ कि चाइना से या कहीं से आई थिंक इंपोर्ट होता था और गवर्नमेंट ने लगा दी इंपोर्ट ड्यूटी ओवरनाइट उनकी मार्केट जो है डबल से एक्सपैंड हो गई वो सिंगल प्लेयर थे और उनकी सेल्स भी डबल हो गई बट समित सर को यह भी पता था कि वो डबलिंग के बाद और नहीं ग्रो कर पाएंगे सेल्स को इट वॉज क्लियर दैट यू नो मैं तीन चार साल बाद इसको हाई मल्टीपल नहीं दे सकता हूँ सो इट्स वेरी क्लियर दैट इट्स अ वेरी यू नो शॉर्ट टर्म काइंड ऑफ प्ले फॉर समित सर सो आई थिंक वो बड़ा इंपॉर्टेंट है कि लाइक आज में जो मल्टीपल मिल रहा है क्या फ्यूचर में इससे बेटर मल्टीपल मिलेगा या वर्स मल्टीपल मिलेगा अगर वर्स मिलेगा तो हमें दैट वी टू बेक इन टू आर कैलकुलेशन कि मैं सेवेंटी पे एग्जिट एंटर कर रहा हूँ प्रॉबेबली फ्यूचर में ये फोर्टी हो सकता है थर्टी हो सकता है तो अगर डबल भी करेंगे अर्निंग तो मेरे को प्रॉफिट नहीं मिलने वाला है मेरा उतना ही रहेगा Uh, ये तो एक तो मतलब मैथ साइड है कि मतलब मैं ग्रोथ देखूं एंट्री मल्टीपल एग्जिट मल्टीपल इसमें इशमोहित की एक वीडियो है लॉरिस के वैल्यूएशन पे बुल एंड बेयर केस वो आप देख सकते हैं उसमें उन्होंने अच्छे से एक्सप्लेन किया है यू नो समथिंग लाइक दैट एक तो वो मैथ साइड है सेकेंड साइड इज द सॉर्ट ऑफ की एक जो मार्केट का एक मैनिक डिप्रेसिव बिहेवियर है किसी चीज को बहुत हाई मल्टीपल दे दिया किसी चीज को बहुत लो मल्टीपल दिया क्यों दिया क्या डिफरेंसेस थे वो बहुत हार्ड है थिंक क्वांटिफाई करना कि किस कंपनी विच कंपनी विल बिकम द लाइक द डार्लिंग ऑफ द मार्केट वो चीज बहुत मुश्किल है एंड दैट एक्चुअली वो हमारे सारे कैलकुलेशन को स्पॉइल कर देता है वो वाला कैलकुलेशन बिकॉज हम सोच सकते हैं कि हमारी कंपनी अच्छी है अर्निंग शुरू कर रही है बट इफ मार्केट डजेंट लाइक इट उसकी वैल्यूएशन घटती रहेगी और हमारा लॉस हो जाएगा तो वो एक हार्ड पार्ट है विच इज वाई वॉट आई प्रेफर इसकी मैं एक ऐसी कंपनी में इन्वेस्ट करूंगा या तो लोग उसको पसंद नहीं करते हैं या तो वो कोई जानता ही नहीं है उस पर कोई रिसर्च नहीं है इन्वेस्टर्स को बताता हूँ तो कहते हैं कि ये कैसी कचरा कंपनी है इस इसको दूर रखो उनसे वो मेरी सबसे प्यारी कंपनी है एग्जांपल हेयर इज सस्ता सुंदर सस्ता सुंदर में मैंने इन्वेस्ट किया है टू हंड्रेड रुपीज अब आई थिंक वो फाइव के आसपास है रफली फोर फिफ्टी टाइप टू हंड्रेड कह रहे थे क्या कंपनी है कुछ नहीं कर पाएगी एमेजोन uh, की ई फार्मेसी है फार्मेजी है सस्ता सुंदर कुछ नहीं कर पाएगा मैंने अपना अच्छे से डीप रिसर्च किया था मैं कन्विंस था कि इनकी ड्यूरेबल कंपेटिटिव एडवांटेजेस है और अब जो है इसको फ्लिपकार्ट ने अक्वायर कर लिया 
तो अब 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 इन्वेस्टर इसको बाय कर रहे हैं अब लोग फोर फिफ्टी पे कह रहे हैं कि हमें खरीदना है सस्ता सोना और अब मैं सोच रहा हूँ कि मैं कब बेचू अभी बेचू या थोड़ा रुक जाऊं दो तीन एक दो साल या जो भी राइट right, थैंक यू एक और माय क्वेश्चन वुड बी ऑन साइक्लिकल्स तो आप साइक्लिकल्स को कैसे देखते हैं अगर मान लो कोई साइक्लिकल कंपनी आपको ट्रैक करनी है और इफ यू वांट टू रीड द बिजनेस कैसे आप अप्रोच रहती है एक तो इसमें हमें आई थिंक समझना ये जरूरी है कि मेरे अंडरस्टैंडिंग में हर कंपनी साइक्लिकल है ऐसा बोलना गलत है कि कोई भी कंपनी साइक्लिकल नहीं है ये गलत है बेटर वे टू पुट इट इज की साइकिल की लेंथ क्या है और कितने एक्सटेंट तक हम अवॉइड कर सकते हैं एक डाउन साइकिल को मतलब कि कितनी एक्सटेंट तक हम प्रिडिक्ट कर सकते हैं कि करंट अब साइकिल कंटिन्यू करे ये आई थिंक हमारे पैरामीटर होने चाहिए हर चीज में एक साइकिल है आप किसी भी कंपनी को देख लीजिए देर इज साइकिल अगर बिजनेस में नहीं है तो वैल्यूएशन में आई टी की वैल्यूएशन सिक्लिकल है एल्कोहल वगैरह की वैल्यूएशन सिक्लिकल है कंपनी मतलब सेक्टर्स तो काफी सारे सिक्लिकल हैं ऑटो ओईएम सिक्लिकल है ऑटो एंसिलरी उनकी वजह से सिक्लिकल है फाइनेंशियल सिक्लिकल है फाइनेंशियल की वैल्यूएशन सिक्लिकल है हर चीज में एक साइकिल है अब आई थिंक हमारे लिए इंपॉर्टेंट ये है कि हम फंडामेंटल ऑन ग्राउंड फैक्टर्स देख पाए कि वो हमारे फेवर में है या वो हमारे अगेंस्ट है जो मैं कहूंगा सबसे घटिया टाइप की कंपनीज है जो कि एक कमोडिटी प्रोड्यूसर है कि मैं कमोडिटी बना रहा हूँ सेलिंग प्राइस मैं डिटरमाइन कर नहीं सकता पास थ्रू करना भी मेरे लिए मुश्किल है और वो कम्प्लीटली एक ओपन मार्केट है जैसे कि स्टील प्रोड्यूसर सीमेंट प्रोड्यूसर या फिर इवन रियल एस्टेट मैं उनसे दूर रहूंगा बिकॉज इट्स वेरी हार्ड फॉर मी एक एक प्योर सिक्लिकल को ट्रैक करने के लिए आपको सप्लाई डिमांड अच्छे से समझना पड़ेगा अगर रियल एस्टेट कंपनी में इन्वेस्ट करना है तो आपको ये समझना पड़ेगा किस किस माइक्रो मार्केट में उनके आ, आ, I think we lost him. We'll just wait till he. Uh, oh, fine, fine, him. fine. I'm here. Accidental? What's your name? I don't want to call you accidental every time. I'll tell you people at some later time. For now, I'm keeping it to accidental investor only. Acha, okay, okay. Uh, keep up the mystery. Also, guys, if you want, if you want to come up, uh, send me a DM and request to speak. Don't do uh, like only one, because otherwise I can't find you to pull you up. So send me the DM and request to speak, unless you're somebody who's very regular here. Ah, so, sorry, I dropped again. Drop हो गया था. Accidental, sir. Basically, मेरे लिए तो ये है कि pure cyclicals, commodity producers से मुझे दूरी रहना है. Very hard to predict. Companies वो चाहिए जिनके पास कुछ तो pricing power हो. प्राइसिंग पावर नहीं है तो एटलीस्ट पास थ्रू है कि मतलब जो, जो भी उनके रॉ मटेरियल इंक्रीजेस होंगे वो उसको पास थ्रू कर पाएंगे उतना तो होना चाहिए अदरवाइज मैं इंटरेस्टेड नहीं हूँ बिकॉज सर मार्जिन को प्रिडिक्ट नहीं कर सकते हम और हमें पूरा सप्लाई डिमांड समझना पड़ेगा कि चाइना में स्टील प्रोड्यूसर्स क्या कर रहे हैं मुझे ये समझना पड़ेगा तो मेरे लिए तो इट्स टू हार्ड आई पोट इट इन टू हार्ड बकेट एंड यू नो ट्राई टू स्टे अवे फ्रॉम इट फाइन फाइन थैंक यू Vikas, you can go ahead. Hi, sir. Good evening. Thanks for the. So, we have. Ab, aapne content share kiya. Basically, my question is that ki abhi jis hisab se commodities ke prices itte bade hai past one and half years mein inflation itta pick up hua hai. To uski wajah se how do you see ki jo abhi India ki consumption theory hai, wo intact hai ya usme jo players hai, how do you? Matlab, aapka kya viewpoint hai consumption sector par? Yes, I want to know first. हाँ, विकास आई थिंक इसमें मतलब हमें एक चीज समझना जरूरी है कि इन्फ्लेशन आया क्यों था अगर हम ट्रैक करते हैं कि हुआ क्या कोविड के दौरान ज्यादातर कंट्रीज ने जो एक्शन uh, लिए वो एक्चुअली गलत एक्शन लिए और ये चीज हमारे जो इकोनॉमिक अफेयर्स एडवाइजर है संजीव सान्याल उन्होंने एक इंटरव्यू uh, में बताया था सबने बेसिकली डिमांड स्टिमुलस दिया डिमांड स्टिमल इस इस केस में सेंस नहीं बनाता था बिकॉज डिसरप्शन थी सप्लाई चेन में सप्लाई चेन डिसरप्टेड थी इन्फ्लेशन इसलिए आया है क्योंकि यूएस के फेड ने सबको पैसे बांटे हैं लिटरली यूएस की गवर्नमेंट ने सबको लिटरली पैसे बांटे हैं इंडिया में भी हमने किया बट बहुत कम किया सिर्फ जो बहुत डिजर्विंग लोग हैं उन्हीं को ट्रांसफर किया सबको नहीं किया तो इंडिया में जो आ रहा है वो सॉर्ट ऑफ ग्लोबल वाला स्पिल हो रहा है थोड़ा सा एक्सपेक्टेशन सबकी ये है कि जैसे जैसे सप्लाई चेन डिफिकल्टीज सॉर्ट आउट होंगी इन्फ्लेशन भी चला जाएगा 
तो आई थिंक फॉर अ लॉन्ग टर्म इन्वेस्टर इसका कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ता है ज्यादा ओके शॉर्ट टर्म थोड़ा हेडवेंट नहीं है बट स्टोरी एंड टेक द लॉन्ग टर्म के लिए जी और सेकंड क्वेश्चन इज द नहीं सॉरी मैं कह रहा था इसमें दूसरी चीज ये भी है कि अगर आप जैसे कंज्यूमर कंज्यूमर की बात कर रहे हैं उसमें अगर ब्रांडेड है तो वो तो सारे ग्रो करें रियल इस्टेट ओन करने का मुझे लॉजिक नहीं समझ में आता इसलिए मैं ओन नहीं करता हूँ बट अगर किसी को करना है तो आई थिंक रियल इस्टेट बहुत अच्छा यू you नो know, लगता है मुझे बट एट द सेम टाइम जैसा कि कृष्णा भी बोल रहे थे ये सब जो है वो फाइनेंशियल एडवाइस नहीं है आपको अपना खुद का ड्यू डेलीजेंस भी करना चाहिए या अपने फाइनेंशियल एडवाइजर से कंसल्ट करना चाहिए ओके okay. I just love having these fun conversations, and especially with like investors with interesting styles and opinions. It's it's always a blast to just like chat and and uh, learn from each other. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, good San- evening, Sanjay. Hi. Sanjay, I'll come to you. We're oh, putting in an order. Don't worry. Uh, you're here. Your uh, style doesn't have anywhere to go. We we'll get to you. Um, so next we've got Shubham, then Vibin, and then Vineet. Shubham bhai, welcome. Krishna bhai, good evening. <laughs> good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, Sahil bhai, good evening. Good. Ah, uh, ye main mera sawal ye tha ki music licensing segment mein hamari two two companies hai Tips aur Sare Gama. To aapko kya lagta hai ki uh, why does Tips has so much of valuation difference with Sare Gama? Is it just because of greater strength of catalog in Sare Gama and management premium or समथिंग कर जस्ट वॉन्ट टू डू क्योंकि आप देखो यूट्यूब व्यूज अगर देखें आप टिप्स इंडस्ट्रीज का तो सारे गांव से कहीं ज्यादा उसमें आते हैं चाहे आप टिप्स पंजाबी का यूट्यूब चैनल है या उनका मेन चैनल जो है उसके बाद भी इतना डिफरेंस है तो ऐसा क्यों आपको लगता है कि आपको लगता है ये नैरो डाउन होगा बाद में या जो जैसा है वैसा वैल्यूशन चलेगा इसमें दोनों कंपनियों में थैंक यू थैंक्स काफी अच्छा कोई सवाल पूछा आपने एंड आई विल बी ऑनेस्ट विद यू की जब मैंने स्टार्टिंग में इन्वेस्ट किया था तब मुझे जो पता था इवेल्यूशन डिफरेंशियल के बारे में अब उसमें बहुत ज्यादा डिफरेंस आया है स्टार्टिंग में मुझे बस इतना पता था कि टिप्स का कैटलॉग बहुत छोटा है सारे गामा का कैटलॉग इज मैसिव एंड उससे फर्क पड़ता है बहुत ज्यादा क्योंकि फाइनली क्या होता है आप आप ऐसे सोचिए कि एज अ एंड प्रोवाइडर लेट से स्पॉटिफाई है एक लाख तीस हजार गानों के एंड यूजर कितने होंगे लेट से टेन मिलियन या ट्वेंटी मिलियन थर्टी मिलियन एंड यूजर्स होंगे टिप्स के तीस हजार गानों के एक एटेलॉग के कितने एंड यूजर होंगे प्रोबेबली उससे आधे भी हो सकते हैं उससे आधे से कम भी हो सकते हैं एंड एंड यूजर को हमें खुश रखना है एज अ म्यूजिक स्ट्रीमिंग ऐप एज अ स्पॉटिफाई एज अ गाना सारे गाना के साथ आप डील ना करें आज की डेट में बहुत हार्ड है इंडिया का सबसे बड़ा कैटेलॉग है उनके पास टिप्स के साथ आप फिर भी अफोर्ड कर सकते हैं डील नहीं करना इनफैक्ट जब मैं दोनों को पढ़ रहा था आप टिप्स में देखेंगे उनका म्यूजिक स्ट्रीमिंग रेवेन्यू एक्चुअली ग्रो ही नहीं किया था कुछ कुछ ड्यूरेशंस में 
उनका इनफैक्ट म्यूजिक स्ट्रीमिंग रेवेन्यू डी ग्रो किया था तो भाई ये तो एक तो एक सवाल तो ये था कि ये हुआ कैसे हाउ डिट इट डी ग्रो अगर आप उनकी कॉन कॉल पढ़ेंगे आप इसमें पाएंगे कि टिप्स के म्यूजिक स्ट्रीमिंग रेवेन्यू में काफी सारा पार्ट एक्चुअली फिजिकल से आता है उनकी फिजिकली लाइसेंसिंग होती है जैसे कि किसी लाइव लाइव म्यूजिक शो में हो रही है मेरा सारे गामा का ज्यादातर रेवेन्यू डिजिटल से आता है तो एक तो क्वालिटी ऑफ अर्निंग क्वालिटी ऑफ रेवेन्यू मच हायर है सारे गामा के केस में पहली चीज दूसरी चीज जैसा कि आपने बोला मैनेजमेंट फोकस बहुत बहुत जमीन आसमान का डिफरेंस है अगर आप टिप्स की मैनेजमेंट को सुनेंगे स्टार्टिंग में कह रहे थे हमारा पे बैक पीरियड जो है वो वन ईयर है आप सोचिए इसका मतलब क्या होगा इसका मतलब कि जो भी सेलर है वो अपना गाना उतने में बेच रहा है जितना प्रॉफिट टिप्स एक साल में कमा लेता है टू मी डेंट मेक सेंस कि ऐसा कैसे हो सकता है वो नंबर ही सेंस नहीं बना रहा था धीरे धीरे जैसे कौन कौन होती गई लोग बार बार पूछते गए उन्होंने वन से उसको थ्री इयर्स कर दिया तो इट मेड मी फील लाइक वो ऐसे ही एक नंबर फेंक रहे थे बेसिकली मेरे सारे गांवों से आप जितनी भी बात पूछोगे वो कहेंगे अप टू फाइव ईयर्स अप टू फाइव ईयर्स हर बार यही बोलेंगे वो तो एक तो वो मैनेजमेंट वाली बात दिखती है डेफिनेटली दूसरी चीज जो मुझे बहुत रिसेंटली समझ में आई अपने सेम गाने के लिए सारे गामा एक्चुअली हायर प्राइसेस निगोशिएट कर पाते हैं बिकॉज ऑफ द प्राइसिंग पावर सेम गाना अगर एक छोटा कैटलॉग होगा पांच हजार गाने का वो चार्ज कर पाएगा मे बी फाइव पैसा पर स्ट्रीम विथ फेसबुक विथ गाना विथ इंस्टाग्राम टिप्स टिप्स मे बी चार्ज कर लेगा सेवन पैसा पर स्ट्रीम सारे गाँव चार्ज कर पाएगा टेन पैसा पर स्ट्रीम एक बहुत बड़ा डिफरेंस है कि उनके पास प्राइसिंग पावर है वो ज्यादा ले पाते हैं बिकॉज उनके उनका कैटेलॉग ही इतना बड़ा है दूसरी चीज तीसरी चीज क्योंकि उनकी बैलेंस शीट इतनी बड़ी है क्योंकि उनकी एग्जिस्टिंग वैल्यूएशन इतनी हाई है तो उनके पास इतना बड़ा एक सॉर्ट ऑफ एक पर्स है कैपिटल मार्केट पब्लिक मार्केट सारे गामा का पर्स है उन्होंने उस पर्स में से अभी पैसे भी निकाले साढ़े सात सौ करोड़ एट एट अ पी ऑफ सेवेंटी या जितना भी देख लिया लाइक फिफ्टी बहुत हाई वैल्यूएशन अब इस पैसे के साथ वो जब कैपिटल एलोकेशन करेंगे और इंडिया का थर्टी फोर्टी परसेंट ऑफ म्यूजिक एक साल का सारा ले जाएंगे तो कैसे कोई कंपीट कर पाएगा उनके साथ बहुत मुश्किल रहेगा टिप्स के लिए भी और बाकियों के लिए One second, just think. I think Shubham Bai got uh, disconnected. Shubham Bai, who now? Either. I think. I I just brought him back. Great. Shubham Bai. Yeah, yeah. Am I am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm. Four times I drop. I'm. I don't know what happened on Twitter. Ah. <laughs> uh, That was that was a quite elaborate answer, Sahil Bhai. And, ठीक आपने तो सारा कुछ कवर कर दिया करीब करीब. बीच में मैं थोड़ा सुन नहीं पाया लेकिन जितना आपने बोला 90 percent मैं understood हो गया उसको. ठीक है ठीक है. यही था तुम्हारा बेटा. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Vibin, bro, what's up? What's up, brother? Long time, long time. <laughs> long time. Well, welcome to my. Uh, This is the first time you're on one of my Twitter spaces, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to Thanks, see you. Thanks, brother. This is absolutely. Did like off on his investment journey like uh, pretty pretty recently, right? Um, while I think over over the period of time I've developed an idea of hey what are all the stocks that I need to buy, but is it is it wise for someone to have cash parked? Okay, I I know that a certain amount of cash is required uh, to cover your six month expense, but beyond that. As as an investor, uh, would you would you think it is wise for for someone to have a uh, cash more than six months salary in his in his bank account without without it being invest? What what would be a framework to think about it? Hey hey, Vibin, sorry for that. I got dropped. Can you maybe repeat your question? Sure, man. So what I'm what I'm saying is, 
if if someone has uh, if someone is clear on where that person wants to invest and has an has an idea um and and he has a lot of cash left okay he has probably more than 6 months of uh, uh cash runway cash that he has left as as a new investor what would you advise him to do should he have cash in his hand or is it is it better that he puts all of this cash to use by investing it so i i think uh, that really depends on the level of risk reward that exists in the investments that you are interested in um for some of my portfolio companies i would be very very happy to deploy uh, all my cash if i wanted to in that position today for some of them i would want to stagger it because they are at a rich valuation doesn't for example we were discussing saregama right and like saregama is at a very rich valuation it's pricing a lot of the future potential so i would not want to like uh, let's say i put x amount of money over time i would not be comfortable putting that same amount of x today in one shot i would want to you know uh, sort of maybe sip into it or something but i think it really depends on the specific companies and the risk reward for them makes sense i mean i mean that's that's super helpful so um okay again again like i said if 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 let's say um the person has a good risk reward equation that's available uh what is your framework do you think 6 months of cash in hand is is a good sort of thing to go by and how how diverse uh, diversified are you or like what are all the different assets that you that you invest in uh so for me around maybe 70 80% of uh, my net worth is in uh, equity apart from that i have bought a home for living which i'm paying the home loan for so you could say that's another asset and the third one is just fixed deposits the only thing is i always want to be sort of 20 to 30% in cash because that covers both the emergencies and that you know 6 month thing and also having extra cash in case there is a market crash because there can always be a market crash at any point uh, if everything drops by 50% i want to have cash to invest so i'm always going to have like 20 30% cash that takes care of both of them to your point on you know 6 months of uh, expenses for uh, as a sort of in a emergency fund that makes a lot of sense the only thing i'll say is that you know like we have to sort of in my opinion build it out over time i would not want to sort of start with a 6 month uh, thing at the beginning maybe in the first year of my earning it might just be one month uh in the second year it might become 3 months in the third year it becomes 6 months i i would personally would be comfortable with that but we have to see our own ability to take risk for example if i have a medical insurance it's very likely that i won't have to touch my emergency funds so it, to my my mind it makes a lot more sense to take a medical insurance rather than to build a emergency fund corpus Cool, Vipin. Is is that it, or do you have another question? No, no, I don't, man. Thank you, thank you for your time. I think thank there you. are lots of speakers waiting. Thank you, sir. Krishna, cool. Uh, Vinay, Krishna, I'll take a moment. Was sorry sir. for the interruption. Hey guys, जो भी आप लोग यहाँ पे हमारे साथ जुड़े हैं, वो Delhi Investors Association Group, क्योंकि ten thousand followers complete करने के वर्ष पे, I would request each and every one to follow the uh, Twitter handle of DIA and uh, If you like these sessions, definitely you should show her your love for Sail and Krishna as well. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, accidental. Uh, Vinit, bro, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's 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 move to Vedant and then Sanjay then. Uh, hello sir my name is uh, vedant and i'm a 14 year old investor from mumbai uh, first of all I, i would like to thank you and krishna sir for this wonderful uh, twitter space um thanks vedant uh what if a stock from a cyclical industry has uh, great growth prospects and is undervalued uh, would you be bullish on it for it 
So I I think uh, thanks for the question, Vidant. I'm very happy to see that there are people like you who are willing to learn all of this at such a young age. That's very exciting to see. Uh, so congratulations for that. Uh, and to answer your question, so I think one problem I see generally in investors is they are eager to value, but not eager to understand. I don't think there's a valuation without the understanding. You can't value something that you don't understand. So if you if you look at cyclicals, right, I would say they are extremely hard to value because it's very hard for even the most seasoned cyclical investors to predict the length of the cycle. So how let's say someone is a great steel investor, ask them for how long can Tata Steel keep making the kind of profits they are making today? I don't think anyone will have an answer. To be very honest with you, they will have a feeling. They will say, "I feel like it will last five years," but I don't think anyone can. deterministically or with any confidence tell you how long then how do you value them i think with cyclicals what i have seen what people say is that you buy them at the point of maximum pessimism when you see that nobody wants to own it it's like below book value or something when the entire cycle is in the gutter you buy it and then when it rises and it goes to euphoria and people start projecting they start saying i think tata steel will have the next 5 years 20% growth that might be probably the best time to sell it at the time of euphoria but again like this is not investment advice and also i am personally no expert at cyclicals i'm just communicating whatever i've learned yes sir uh, thank you just one more an- another question i would like to add is but for example uh, i have i did some research and i learned like some people have the opinion that at the end uh china spreads fake uh, false news that um they have some winter drawbacks but then they uh produce more steel and that way they just increase the output so doesn't that mean that uh, since the um like since december is coming to an end it it's at the bo- uh, steel is at the bottom of the cycle I I think we we lost Sahil again. Uh one sec. But uh you know before uh, uh while Sahil comes back uh I also want to share like a uh, a personal experience on this. Um I don't in- invest in cyclicals at all. Um but you know in in 2018 19 I I I took a bet on a cyclical company called Graphite India. um and uh, and just to just to tell you like how crazy these cycles can be um at that point if you look up uh, you know um these uh, brokerage reports and even foreign institutional investors the the reports that they took out there were upsides of 80 90 100% um on uh, graphite india and hg and within like no time i mean literally in a month these stocks dropped from over a thousand bucks to 300 bucks so with a cyclical it's really hard you know to know when what is going to happen and also you have to understand that uh, with china they control 70 to 90% of the world steel production so they have a huge leg up in terms of being able to release supply and, and control commodity prices uh, even even in um you know other commodities so uh, you know like sail pointed out it's it's very important to be a subject matter expert when you are investing in cyclicals or you develop that as your investment style with that i'll pass it on to uh, sail thank you thank you sir yeah thanks krishna i i completely agree with you and you know sorry i got dropped off again but from what i could hear vedant was talking about how you know china might be spreading some misinformation and all of that that is precisely why i find these commodities cyclicals extremely hard to invest in because you have to know so much and then you have to know the authenticity of the information and so forth so i'm sorry but you know i don't think it Uh, is something which is very easy for retail investors to do the only thing i have sort of seen which sort of seems to work is you buy it when it's much 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 below value and nobody wants to touch it at the point of maximum pessimism you wait 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 you might have to wait 2 3 5 years and then you'll get like uh, some multi multi multiple time return and then you sell at 
you know whenever you feel like i have had enough <laughs> that's the only thing i can say thank you sir thank you very much thanks thanks vedant again you know it's it's really awesome to have uh investors of your age coming out to to you know our our platform and i'd love to see you come for you know m- more uh, more of my spaces dia spaces sahil spaces i mean any investor spaces yes, definitely definitely vinith i think you're back yeah i'm there yeah you can go ahead thanks krishna thanks for the opportunity and sahil a uh, great session uh, i have i've been a regular on dia uh, i just wanted to have small two questions i will not take much of your time uh, first one is related to the fixed deposit and second one is related to the music industry itself and uh, based on the fixed deposit you specifically mentioned that uh, you have taken a fixed deposit in idfc first bank uh, uh, is the interest rate only factor or is there any other softer points uh, you went to you decided to go ahead with idfc first because indus in bank also has very good competitive interest rate environment right now so actually like it was a combination of two or three things uh, they actually came to my society to open my bank account they literally just took my aadhar number and my fingerprint on their uh, electronic machine they opened my bank account and i could transfer it was like zero friction for me it's it's the fact that they came to me if indusind had come i might have taken an indusind it is that like idfc first came first and the point is this is the fascinating thing about casa once you have a very large amount of money in a bank account you don't want to move it just for 1% because you have a fixed deposit if you break that fixed deposit you have to pay tax on it you don't want to do that right you'll try to hold it you're not going to move money over 1% of uh, you know gains so sahil just out of curiosity out of the total portfolio uh, what would be the percentage as fixed as a fixed deposit in terms of- uh something like 15 20% hello did we lose him one second i think he's back also uh, sanjay or next and then is ramanjit roger the second part of question sahil i wanted to uh, have a uh, discussion on was the music industry right now is very very uh, you know mediator centric like you have labels in between artist and the consumers a uh, lot of places like in financial industry like in travel industry there is a decentralization coming in due to blockchain so do you think that a blockchain uh, technology can bring that kind of decentralization in music industry and eventually saregama and tips like players would have something like what happened to the audio cassettes in past so i, I think we have to sort of you know uh, instead of being able to like make a top down prediction we have to understand the technology and then figure out how it might impact as far as i understand it like blockchain and all are about the implementation the fact that instead of having a centralized trust you build a uh, something like a uh, uh distributed trust system like instead of, like for example if you look at the banking system right it's the rbi and their processes which guarantee that any time you make a transfer for example upi all of it is regulated by rbi they try to make sure that everything you send will actually reach the other person that's the guarantee in the case of blockchain there is no guaranteeing authority it's the algorithm right so i don't think like that technology by itself means much to saregama but you have brought up a great point which is uh, there is a concentration of a different type where like the largest music whoops oh, gone again <laughs> yeah he'll be back so krishna this is this is a usual uh, issue of spaces uh, this is this is my ninth join in in this space today i th- i think sahil's own record will beat yours 
I, I think he's joined uh, left and joined more than nine times. I've counted at least six in the last thirty minutes with sides. <laughs> Five yeah, six. sorry for that. I don't feel like why they are picking me for this, but uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, essentially, like what what happens is with uh, people like Saregama, right? Uh, music production itself is very centralized. People like Barsha are bringing in the billions of views. People like uh, I think for tips, Guru Randhava, right? Guru Randhava, like so many billion views, eight hundred million view songs. Uh, question for us is. Will music production itself get decentralized? Will it be the case that you and I will become singers? Software will help all of us become as good a singer as Guru Randhava. Uh, augmented reality can help us make a video that is as realistic as Guru Randhava's video. I think that might be a big risk. We have to figure out like how that works. But I think that's very far away. Maybe ten years, fifteen years. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not a very distant dream of like six, seven months or one year. I am saying. in the eventuality so what happened with the cassettes it happened uh, in just two three years and all the cassettes were gone and all everybody had cds and everybody had usbs that time and uh, if that kind of thing happened that will happen very quickly whenever it will happen it's not very distant but it's not very near that's also. not true like if you look at most trends they, they are not immediate they takes at least like you said two or three years right and we can actually look at the the sort of the initial parts of the trend in the con calls in the numbers so many investors are tracking right we actually get to know at every point in time which is why we have to track these things like a hawk we can't just buy and forget it every single quarter four times a year we have to show up to the con call listen to them see what other investors are saying validate our own thesis all like four times a year at least also con calls are to be read yeah and and like essentially my point is if you if you carefully observe most of these changes are not a step function they take at least 3 or 4 years it's not like today it's there and tomorrow it's not there right it takes time you have to be like a hawk and always be on the guard always be looking for these things right and like you rightly said build a catalog of anti thesis pointers what can go wrong with my business and actively try to seek evidence for that can you actually show any evidence for this happening if there is evidence then i would sit up and take notice i would say that the risk has gone up and i might even sell so to substantiate also, uh, uh, that Vinny, just to say uh, i want i want to make a point here um, just to uh, you know because this is an um, a uh, stock in an industry that i've studied i i haven't i don't have any positions yet but just to point out one very critical difference because we were talking about this the other day on dii also if you remember um what's what's really interesting is the us model for streaming and the indian model for streaming is actually very different because the catalog is very different so while you know sail spoke about guru randhava and uh, you know other individual pop stars they still make up a, a relatively small percentage of all the music that's listened to as far as hindi music goes a lot of the music is still quote unquote bollywood which comes as part of production of movies and uh, you know like sail pointed out if the if the production even shifts for individual audio uh, that's still not going to take up the lion share of of what these uh, streaming companies have because still to to make a movie a small budget one costs 20 crores and a big budget one can cost up to 200 250 even 500 crores so these sorts of budgets aren't just going to be available and one of the big reasons why music works is because it's associated with this really powerful storytelling and um you know a lot of the libraries in in india are are music libraries associated to movies the the individual artists are picking up but uh, you know it's still not a large enough part of the portfolio for the disruption to be the same in my understanding the disruption would be way harder uh, in the us and other developed markets than it will be in a country like india where the music is still very much related to the movies Krishna can I add No no I I completely uh, Krishna I completely agree with this point and I completely buy this that uh, most of Indian music industry is majorly 
tilted towards the bollywood songs and uh, there is less of pop culture in india and less of individualized artist uh, uh, content but uh, to be very true uh, if uh, a person who is in the film industry like maybe ar rahman who is at the top shot he starts saying to the music labels that no 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 i, I am going to have a lion share of the revenue of music rights which you are selling in the market then that's a disruptor change because it that will be. trickle down it won't be vinith do you do you know why it won't be do yeah, you know why the reason is because ar rahman does not have integrations with these streaming apps what will he do with those rights no what i'm saying is he start selling his own music what he creates to whom when he creates on mm-hmm. the platforms for which he creates himself those platforms won't have the users right the users are on spotify and on uh, youtube that's where the users so, are again um, we are coming to a point where the disruption has not happened so uh, that disruption when it will happen then it will happen quick but for example person- tiktok was a disruption please understand tiktok was a disruption and uh, there were no models uh, so first of all there India. has to be there has to be a viable company which is doing this right there aren't any companies which are doing this at least right now it is not there right that's what i'm saying at least yeah. there has to be some evidence then we can set up take notice and then try to factor in this and i am going to tell you this if there is such a thing so you can find thousand stories you know x has raised y million dollars to disrupt music stream you can find thousand such stories even in the us the thing is none of them work because users don't want to go to those apps they, they those apps don't work just think of it this way uh first of all it's a ecosystem right think of it this way, it's a ecosystem all these apps ha- have to take that 1 lakh 30000 songs because people don't just want to listen to ar rahman songs if there is a platform with just ar rahman songs who's going to download that app uh, who's going like to download that i agree i sahi like completely agree today there is no ecosystem for this kind of thing i am completely agreeing to this there is no visibility of it also i am just trying to uh, say that there is a decentralization happening in many industries and in future there is a chance that that decentralization can come to music industry also so we me, never know when will it happen me, let me put it this way uh, investing is all about probabilities i don't think that's a high probability event right now there is no evidence to suggest that it's a high probability event It just because decentralization happened in some places does not mean it will happen everywhere if you listen to some pms managers india is getting more centralized uh, uh, most of the i think it happened again krishna can i add something in this like whatever you are saying i read the, i get this question on the con call also like someone said ki some some point time people get directly go to the music streaming to sare gama said ki if they will go we will protest we will simply say we will not sell to you that they were said ki they are saying ki they will not allow like individual artist to go directly to music streaming if they will go they will protest so that's that's the point for the so point is uh, they, they are they are very shaken about that if if a, if a, if a, if a producer of music or if a content creator directly sells to the consumer it's very detrimental to all these mid players in between yeah so they will not allow and company will not take risk of the, like tips and sare exactly. gama because if all these all these they will say na they will not go so other thing is youtube until we are not seeing ki some individual artist is getting like uh, millions of you like billions of you then then we cannot so he i either one stream has to take uh, either youtube or uh, e- streaming if we, when we are start seeing he like one billion in youtube individual creator is getting then then we can be accept, is expect like yeah, this, ki, yeah, this can happen yeah, yeah. Other, absolutely and and like one thing i want to say is like investing is about probabilities right now that probability is not visible actually uh and like i was saying some industries are going more towards consolidation music streaming is an example of that it's going more towards consolidation if it goes towards more diversification or decentralization we need to see the evidence for that 
uh, because the problem is for any company on earth i can come up with an antithesis any company on earth then by that logic i can't own equity right so i have to think about the probabilities i don't think right now that probability is there but of course like as investors we have to monitor like a hawk we always have to look for antithesis anyone shows me an article says x has raised money for disrupting uh, content owners i'm going to read those articles and i'm going to see what their plans are that's it side from my side thank you thank you for all your insights and thank you krishna for hosting this space thank you any time bro thank you uh, good evening uh, sahil thank you krishna and delhi investors association uh, sahil i've loved listening to you before i start compliments to vedan that 14 year old boy amazing stuff i wish more young men and women came on board hats off i'm following you you spoke like a 40 year old uh, sahil few questions quickly for you uh, one is since you've all been talking about sare gama and tips and stuff like that uh, have you factored out the value of you know their production houses and also the inherent value of video advertising video promotions video blogging apart from the music part promotions vlogging won't that cause uh, some deep level of disruption first part yeah so i think like essentially what you have to understand is uh, you know all content was not created equal among all content music actually stands as the first among equals the reason is music has extremely high repeat value you don't just listen to a song once like not the favorite ones at least right i mean one of my songs that i really love is numb by linkin park i've been listening to it it since 6th class and i that's sort of the only song i listen to like many many times right thousands of times that is not there in blogs or even in podcasts or even in movies here yeah, like krishna is talking about reading a book twice that's the repeat value you watch a good movie two times three times you're not going to watch it thousand times so that that makes a huge difference any blogs vlogs you're going to watch it once done gaya bhad whereas with a song going to re- listen to it again and again and again the reason for that is people listen to song for the emotions what it makes you feel they don't actually listen to it i as far as i understand it for the lyrics okay that's a great point i i didn't think of that side uh, secondly i wanted your views on ev hydrogen powered vehicle market in india in the future do you see us being able to complete the cycle and put up so much charging infra infra etc because in 70 years we haven't even been able to make proper roads there are big cities today in india which have power cuts once or twice a week even now you know i just wanted to get your take on that so you're absolutely right and as with most things in a country like ours there will be a, a divide you know there will be the haves and the have nots there will be parts of india like bangalore and delhi which will be faster and easier to get electrified versus the rural parts of india right uh, i mean electrified in the sense of evs uh, so definitely that will be there there will be these inequalities uh, but i think what is important for investors to see is the tide where is the tide the tide is in the favor of saving the environment and phasing out fossil fuels which are unsustainable that tide is sort of unstoppable now i, I don't think even if you lo- even if you listen to coal oil gas companies they're talking about putting up solar power plants basically yes. everybody wants to do this now yeah. right mm-hmm. so th- this is something that has to happen now you're 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 bang on on one of the points which is distribution distribution is sort of the bottleneck in all of this in the renewable energy ev solar the, the bottleneck is distribution and it's incredibly hard to solve forget india which like you rightly said we don't even have roads It's hard mm. to have distribution. Mm. If you look at even America, America is facing tremendous problems. They have to double the size of their grid to accommodate full conversion to EV. How are they going to do it? It's, I don't know. To the, to be honest with you, I think they will have to be a lot more decentralized uh, power generation. A lot more of you know people trying to charge their own EVs. They might be the first adopters. For example, if I had an individual unit, I would want to have a solar panel. and a battery and then buy an ev so that i can charge my ev so like in light of this do, what do you think of the battery swapping market because let's say i'm living in bombay and i'm driving a tata nexon to goa i can't obviously make it on one charge so i'm going to need two or three charges and 
you know the fun of jo- long distance driving today is driving non stop or one stop but with the ev charging i'll be stopping for 2 to 2 hours maybe 3 times on the way battery swapping are there companies that are looking at setting up battery swapping networks because a charge would take 2 to 3 hours i'd imagine 2 hours least you know this is a market i was i was looking at and i didn't find too many guys setting up grids for that yeah actually you know the thing with uh, all the, all of that is uh, it's very hard to make a prediction in a very disruptive industry about what technology what stack will win in the end will it be fast charging will it be battery swap it's very hard because this is the cutting edge of human knowledge and ingenuity people are working over time to make batteries that last 1500 miles i don't know if you knew this someone is working on a aluminum air battery this is a air battery meaning air is the cathode they're making a aluminum air oh. battery which will last 1500 miles like people are researching on it tesla has openly said that in the next couple of years they are going to half the 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 prices of their batteries or effectively double the rate basically for all their cars right now tesla gets like 300 400 miles per car they are going to double yes. it that's going to happen in house that's the like tesla research by the reason i'm pointing that out is <coughs> sorry it's very hard to i think bet on like one technology or like you know like what's going to win out um it's easier to bet on the like the tide the tide is in ev favor whether it will be swap or whether it will be a new battery very hard to tell that is also why i would be i would stay away from battery makers because it's very hard to tell will it be lithium ion iron ion aluminum ion i don't know okay got that last last question everyone talks of you know whether it's foreign broking houses indian that the indian markets are greatly overheated and the stocks are in inflated bubble there's corrections happening yet everyone also says in the same breath india is the market of future and nifty is going to blast to 18 to 22k now this is you know such a paradox of statements either you find it overheated or you find that it's going to go to 22k if it's going to 22k these same stocks are going to go up what is your view on the market in general actually like i I'll, i'll point out couple of very important things here first is that like i i don't think uh, like i i look at all this market commentary as entertainment i don't think it actually helps the investor trying to create alpha for entertainment sake yes i mean i love listening to them and like figuring out but even they're right if you look at couple of things first if you listen to samit vartak sir he points out look at the cash flows look at how uh companies are generating cash flows you will figure out that actually they are not as overvalued as you think they are i think forward multiples for some of these uh, uh indices are more like 20 22 times not 28 30 times they're not that overvalued as we think that they are first uh second thing about you know like uh, overvaluation versus outperformance so i think it really depends on like where we are in the capex cycle and like revival of the gdp right if you might have read to if you might have read about the 2003 to 7 era right uh companies and i mean index itself might have generated 20% kagar so if an index is going to generate 20% kagar like even 30 p might not actually be very expensive if you are going to get 20% kagar in the next 5 years from nifty so it's a it's a very complicated thing to be honest no so thank you so much sail and thank you krishna thank you uh wonderful talking to you guys thank you yes awesome uh, hi raman ji thanks for being super patient please go ahead no worries uh thanks thanks for hosting this first of all and so sahil uh, just wanted to check with you on um apis uh and i'm actually talking about apis uh who work directly with innovators so that's what we know um so i mean there's a lot of unseen part because of course they don't want to disclose what stage of collaboration they are with innovators um so for example uh i've been tracking newland and especially interested in two of their businesses one with innovators and two the peptide business um but from the con call you get in hint that they are deepening their relationship with existing clients um but my my concern not a concern but i'm a bit curious is that it's too small a uh, company so i don't know if they can actually partner as cdmo for innovator companies um and two i don't know 
at what stage they are for certain molecules so i don't know if you even track this field but if you do then how do you try to get some perspective from the con call and limited information that comes your way so thanks for the question ramanjit uh, newland does tell the disclosure i am invested it's probably one of the companies where i've done probably highest amount of work in my life for one of the things like what i did is i uh, tracked and sort of read about all their like 70 80 100 apis that took like, like a month. month so my point being that you know this is a incredibly hard space to track and be able to may form opinions on uh, what you can do for the innovator space is try to look on the internet you will find names for example even though newland will never acknowledge it because of confidentiality everyone knows that they make ostedo for teva teva is the innovator they make ostedo for teva so and by the way teva even discloses ostedo sales a quarter on quarter in their uh, earnings call so there are ways to make those connections you know uh, there are there are basically what happens is for newland its confidentiality but someone somewhere in teva might have talked and then you know the article and so everyone is able to figure out uh, so even though things are confidential we can still make some you know headway that's one second to answer your question yes we are absolutely right they are small which is why uh it doesn't make sense to bet your house on it like it's purely in terms of risk reward or just say let's say risk uh loris is far far less riskier than newland just look at the like where they are in their journey right loris it might have started like 2 3 years ago already their cdm was 650 crore or something and newland C- uh, cdm is probably 300 crore or maybe even lesser than that even though they are maybe 6 7 years old because they are a smaller business innovators are bound to be more sort of you know skeptical of it you are absolutely right but the point is that is where the highest amount of alpha lies so i think this comes back to my earlier point it is only investors like sajal sir who do deep deep research in the circle of their confident co- co- competence over years and be able to understand the science of the company once you understand the science then you don't care about the price you are just going to I think we'll have him back in a minute. Oh, we Yeah, we lost Sahil again. Uh, I I can't hear anything. No, no, Sahil's Probably back now. Not. Okay, okay, Sahil. So we had lost him. We had lost him. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So thanks, uh, Sahil, for that information. Actually, yeah. So you're right. I mean, I have I have a small position with Newland because I find it uh, promising, but um, then there's as much as you know about it. Um, and one of the reason was that one of my very favorite uh, investing house uh, malabar um, has invested heavily in it and uh, whenever i hear them talking about uh, newland i feel that uh, newland is up to some uh, big things but then yeah it's a small company uh, if i have a chance to ask one more question if you could just make any make any broad uh, uh, views on uh, the whole saas ecosystem you know we keep getting was So come in. So if you could say something about it. So I, I think uh, Ramanjit, like uh, since I belong to the software uh, ecosystem, right? I can tell you one thing. Like from a software engineer's perspective, uh, and from a like software like uh, like technical person's perspective, uh, there's not much of a difference. But the big difference in terms of business. is that earlier companies used to probably create bespoke products and sell them like that's still there to some extent but now companies are trying to make it more on like a per request basis you know chargeable that you call my api 
आई एम गोइंग टू रिस्पेक्ट योर एपीआई ऑन अ पर रिस्पेक्ट ऑन अ पर रिक्वेस्ट बेसिस आई एम गोइंग टू चार्ज यू ऑलमोस्ट लाइक स्ट्रीमिंग राइट सारे गामा थे दैट इज आल्सो सास बेसिकली वेयर लाइक एवरी टाइम यू स्ट्रीम अ अ सॉन्ग सारे गामा गेट्स पेड 10 पैसा दैट इज सास सॉफ्टवेयर एज अ सर्विस the point is software as a service only brings some predictability of revenues that's sort of the only difference everything that saas companies are doing was happening even without them but now it's more predictable more sort of steady which is why the valuations might be higher okay thanks and thanks for answering my questions sir and thanks krishna for hosting this thank you most welcome uh before we move back to accidental i just want to point out that you know uh, rajiv um shivakumar uh deepak you guys have been waiting for a really long time and requested but you haven't sent me any message over dm uh telling me what you want to talk about so please message me so that i can pull you guys up uh accidental go ahead Accidental, are you here? Uh, Krishna, I will not provide you. Please go ahead with others. Okay, okay. Uh, Fatehpur, bro, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I have a question related to Jubilee and food. So Jubilee and food, if you see, it is correcting. So I want to ask, it is because of the multiple peer got uh, already there, and he it was or somehow overvalued, and the, because of that, it is getting uh, like some correction or uh, this uh, raw material prices are main reason. So that I want to ask. Uh, hey Fatehpur, so I think what happens with these things is. it is it is basically impossible to tell right think of it this way the valuation of a company is built like a cake you have the most strongest investors at the bottom they might have bought at a 10 lakh lower price they are not in a hurry to sell and then there are momentum traders at the top in the middle is probably everyone else we don't know why they are selling what their objectives are we can try to guess but i don't get what the point of that is right but i'll pay, i'll tell you one thing for sure If you're paying ninety to hundred times PE for a company, you have to be very careful. Obviously, like uh, especially if it's going like fifteen twenty percent, you have to be very careful. Uh, there's this narrative that some investors or managers might try to push that like a hundred PE company will continue being hundred PE for the next twenty years or something. I think we have to be very careful with that. Like it's uh, it's not a given. It might happen. Or it might not happen. And like you rightly said. one of the things that potentially might be happening with jubilant is there are no other competitors so that that's something called scarcity premium right the fact that anyone who wanted to buy a qsr had to buy a dominos that is not true anymore some of those people don't worry guys he'll be back This is probably number fourteen for him, huh? Krishna, <laughs> I think uh, this is deliberate on the part of Twitter. वो कह रहे हैं कि इतनी देर free में space कैसे कर रहे हो तुम लोग comfortably? Yeah, it, it's a it's a crazy space. We're we're at two hours and twenty four minutes, and there are more than three hundred of you hanging around. No, it's about two forty to fifty now. अच्छा कृष्णा मेरा एक क्वेश्चन है यार जब तक एक जो बिगनर्स डायलेमा होता है उसके ऊपर क्वेश्चन एक स्टोरी है बेसिकली फादर सन होते हैं और एक गधा होता है ठीक है दे वर वॉकिंग तो उनको एक पहला बंदा देखता है तो वो कहता है यार तुम्हारे पास गधा यार तुम फिर भी पैदल चल रहे हो राइट तो वो दोनों क्या करते हैं गधे पे बैठ जाते हैं फिर थोड़ी आगे चलते हैं एक बंदा और मिलता है तो कहता है देखो कितने दुष्ट है बेचारे गरीब जानवर को परेशान कर रखा है और इतने कट्टे कट्टे फादरसन दोनों उसके ऊपर बैठे हैं <laughs> तो वो क्या करता है फिर वो एक जना उतर जाता है तो बेटा बैठा रहता है फिर एक और टकराता है उसको कहता है यार देखो बाप इसका पैदल चल रहा है और ये आराम से गधे पे बैठ के जा रहा है <laughs> तो थोड़ी देर आगे चलते हैं तो फिर वही बाप बैठ जाता है और बेटा तो लाइक वाइज देर आर देर आर फोर सिचुएशन है ना जो बिगनर्स है शुरू में जब वो अपनी इन्वेस्टिंग जर्नी शुरू करता है तो उसको चार पांच जगह से अलग अलग एडवाइस आ रहे हैं तो मतलब कैसे सेटल डाउन करे एक पे एक्सीडेंटल वुड यू बी ओके आंसर दैट Yes. Yeah. Yeah, more than happy. 
so actually you've brought up a wonderful kind of a parable uh, example kind of thing uh, and answer dono ka same hai ki hame apna ek inner score card rakhna hota hai and apni baat sunni hoti hai yani ki hum sunenge sab ki but karenge jo hame samajh mein aayega that is exactly how the father son need to behave that is exactly how investors need to behave everyone will tell us and ye to sabke sath hota hai right even to me my uh, wife parents brother friends everyone will tell me something finally i have to listen to myself you know whatever i want to do and that's true for the investor that's true for the father son also in your story yeah yeah <laughs> perhaps in the family you have to maintain a balance but in case of investing how to do that matlab well, aapko basically apne apna thoda reflection karke apne aap se puchna hai ki sachai kya hai that is what we have to ask because har insaan ka apna ek perspective hai warren buffett bhi jo jo cheeze bolte hain unke followers unse 100% agree nahi karte hain in fact aap kisi se bhi puchhenge they will quickly point out ki warren buffett ke sayings mein bhi contradictions hain ओल्डर वॉरन बफेट कैन कॉन्ट्रोडिक्ट यंगर वॉरन बफेट राइट तो पॉइंट बी कि हमें एक अपने आप से पूछना है कि ट्रूथ क्या है सच्चाई क्या है सच्चाई के पास क्या है एंड वो उसको फिगर आउट करने के लिए सबसे आसान तरीका यही है कि जितना पढ़ सकते हो पढ़ो बट सिर्फ बुक्स मत पढ़ो एक्चुअली स्टोरीज के बारे में पढ़ो एंड लेट मी गिव अ कॉन्क्रीट एग्जाम्पल है अब आप ज्यादातर लोगों को देखेंगे वो कहेंगे ओहो कॉर्पोरेट गवर्नेंस इश्यूज है हम माइक्रो कैप्स को टच नहीं कर सकते प्रमोटर्स मोटी सैलरी ले रहे हैं हम इन्वेस्ट नहीं कर सकते दैट इज व्हाट मोस्ट पीपल विल टेल यू बट अगर आप प्रैक्टिशनर से पूछोगे अगर आप उन लोगों से पूछोगे जिन्होंने हंड्रेड बैगर बनाए हैं अगर आप वैल्यू पिकर पे दस साल की थ्रेड पढ़ोगे तब आपको समझ में आएगा कि कॉर्पोरेट गवर्नेंस एक पिक्चर नहीं होती है वो एक मूवी है वो इवॉल्विंग है आपको उसकी डायरेक्शन देखनी है आपको ये नहीं देखना है कि फॉरन ऑथर क्या बोल रहे हैं कि या फिर विथ ऑल ड्यू रिस्पेक्ट डॉक्टर विजय मलिक क्या बोल रहे हैं कि यहाँ पर रिलेटेड पार्टी ट्रांजेक्शन है दिस कंपनी इज नॉट इन्वेस्टेबल एट ऑल yeah just to add to what uh, sail said uh, it, it's very you know um, i i i would have uh, said the exact same thing that uh, you know it's most important uh, for the father and son to do exactly what it is that they please because no matter what you do you aren't going to make everybody happy um and um, also as far as a, you know a guiding principle goes uh i say you know take on only that much which you have the capacity to study and if you use that as a you know as a guiding light and you you stick to you know making difficult decisions only when they're absolutely necessary because there's a reason why the investment space is, is organized the way it is there's a reason why mutual funds exist there's a reason why pms exists and there's a reason why you know you have the ability to to directly invest and even within these uh, direct investments there are some you know investing styles that are easier and more suited towards beginners like uh, you know uh, where you invest in things that you use for example being a very very rudimentary uh, investing philosophy so uh, you know increase your complexity as as you uh, you know uh, uh, go along the journey because the the biggest amount of progress you make the moment you become an investor from that moment onwards it's it's only incremental returns and as you go up the spectrum like uh, actually the, the the returns in in uh, in absolute terms diminish you 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 have to work way harder than you need to from like 15 to 20% uh, then you do from uh you know 10 to 15% or even from like 25 to 27% is probably way harder than 15 to 25% so i mean get started on the journey and then lo- figure out what your learning capacity is and optimize your journey accordingly completely agreed with krishna yeah fine thanks makes sense thank you cool uh Fatehpur did you have another question or something else you wanted to add yeah in this only uh, like i want what so are you saying sail ki there is a consolidation going on on the qsr industry because more player are there and also some are saying ki we are evita positive so people are seeing hope in other player also so there is this concept of something called scarcity premium the mm-hmm. idea is ki if there is exactly one company of a type everybody will want to invest in that company 
बट एज सुन एज देर आर अदर कंपनीज ऑफ द सेम टाइप इन्वेस्टर्स गेट अ चॉइस कि अब मैं शुड आई टेक वन और शुड आई टेक टू शुड आई टेक ए और बी दैट माइट बी वॉट्स हैपनिंग टू डोमिनोज की लाइक एवरी वन वॉज ऑन द डोमिनोज बैंड वैगन नाउ मे बी टेन परसेंट पीपल वेंट टू बर्गर किंग टेन परसेंट पीपल वेंट टू पिज्जा हट बट द प्रॉब्लम इज इट्स हार्ड टू एक्चुअली फिगर दैट आउट बिकॉज वी नीड सो मच डेटा राइट इफ आई हैड ऑल द एन एस सी डेटा आई माइट है otherwise it's very hard to tell yeah and the thing i was like uh, reading this a lot of people are saying ki if you see like uh, customer stickiness so they were saying ki only dominoes has the customer who come back uh, uh, every time other than like, if you say burger king or Mac- macd all they are supposed selling is, is like uh, some thing all are same their product is almost same so because of that customer is like not sticky nature it is behaving like one customer will go here and the next time he will go to another place but in case of dominos same guy is going matlab repeat customer it is getting so people were saying ki this will not affect so what is your view with this so you, you you have pointed out something wonderful which is even in the qsr not everyone is equally innovative not everyone has that same you know desire to sort of create sticky customer relationships i personally feel that dominos is most sticky but that is just my opinion as a user of dominos so between burger king pizza hut everyone the only thing i will definitely eat once in one or two weeks is dominos everything else i might eat once a year dominos i'll definitely eat once in two weeks or something but then the problem is i am it's is very hard to say ki you know the my view is how the world should be that's also one of the risks that investors carry if you can't think that your view is the world's view the only way mm-hmm. is you know ask a poll ask people around you take an honest opinion in ev- he'll be back <laughs> 17 कृष्णा कैन यू आस्क दिस पोल सो दैट दिस पीपल ऑल्सो कैन गो देर एंड पीपल गेट सो दैट वी विल गेट सम इन्फो वॉट इज पोल like uh, like uh, if in, like a lot of QSR player are there do you will still like buy more number of time from uh, like Domino's or you will diversify you you're buying cool i'll 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 put out a poll right after this uh, uh, mm-hmm. this quiz i think it will be interesting don't you think sir sure i mean uh, absolutely the like the, the only thing is we should again be aware that our followers are sort of probably in the top 1 2% of india again they don't represent all of india like you can't ask uh, for that we'll have to take more efforts maybe you know to include all kinds of consumers mm-hmm. yeah Yeah. If I may interrupt here, there's also the difference between Domino's is held by one company, whereas McDonald's has two companies: Hard Castle, Westlife, uh, Pizza Hut has Deviani, Sapphire. So you know the the revenues get fragmented there. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. And other thing, uh, Domino's I was seeing that like they have started Hong Kitchen, which is Chinese. then they are some uh, biryani and if you see the like a uh, most uh, bought thing then it is chinese and biryani and pizza so dominoes is targeting all these three how you see the future i'll be honest with you like i'm not the f- expert on dominoes the reason is the valuation is out of whack the problem is at 108 90 whatever the pe is you're paying for like at least 20 years of earnings I am not comfortable paying for twenty years of earnings of any company on earth. If God created a company, I would not buy it at hundred p. Okay. So uh, next question, I, related to uh, like uh, IEX. Like uh, I, if I was saying that people are saying that we are moving toward uh, renewable energy. Renewable energy means it will be distributed. Like some part uh, there will be, will be one in it can be UP and other things so that we, all these the electricity will be distributed. so all these will be sell, sold mostly on the iex and so it it is long term bet like i was saying even if it is valuation higher valuation I, i think like essentially i would urge you to you know deep dive more uh, to be very honest with you i don't track iex that closely uh, definitely definitely there are some very strong tailwinds for them uh, we want government wants most of the power to be traded on exchanges 
but it's not clear that IAS will be the only exchange in the world, right? In fact, NSC and BSC also want to get into power trading. So then IAS might become more like a broker uh, than an exchange. So I think like you have to study that. Uh, I haven't studied it very closely. Okay, that much. One more, one more thing which I can add on IAS. कि जैसे कि गवर्नमेंट ने क्या बोला कि 25 परसेंट पावर ट्रेडिंग हम देख रहे हैं उनका कोई टाइमलाइन दिया हुआ है अगले दस साल का पांच साल का मुझे याद नहीं एक्जैक्टली पर ये कोई चीज डिस्कस नहीं कर रहा है कि भाई उसका फीस क्या होने वाला है अभी तो अगर फीस मान लो फिफ्टी परसेंट कम हो गया या सिक्सटी परसेंट कम हो गया बिकॉज एज द स्केलेबिलिटी इंक्रीजेज द प्राइस द ट्रांजेक्शन फीस भी लॉस हो गया ट्रेडिज ना उसको भी आपको मैटर करना है उसको भी आपको देखना पड़ेगा अगर फीस आधा हो गया फिर तो आई एस की बच जाएगी हाँ लोग बोल रहे हैं कि जो मार्केट कपलिंग ला रहे हैं लोग पहले एम्बेड फिर मार्केट कपलिंग तो इसके बाद बोल रहे हैं कि अराउंड ट्वेंटी परसेंट जो मार्केट शेयर जाएगा देन दे विल रिड्यूस टू टू दैट आई एम गेटिंग सम ऑफ न्यूज हाँ इट कैन बी फिफ्टी परसेंट न्यूज कैन बी सिक्सटी परसेंट न्यूज कैन बी एट्टी परसेंट वॉच एवर माइट बी आई थिंक अबाउट आई एक्स दैटिंग द एडवांटेज ऑफ फर्स्ट मूवर मार्केट शेयर ऑफ नाइन्टी फाइव परसेंट सो now you see asian paints barger paints and so on asian paints still the market leader i might be wrong in long term but for short term or medium term this should be the case but but devan sir devan sir you should think about it like this asian paints yes market leader but indigo paints has grown 30% for last 10 years so yeah, actually right. they have taken away market share from asian paints so like but actually but still there but still, still their market leader there is this fascinating so, Uh, just uh, please let me complete this is fascinating quote by peter thiel we should not focus on first mover we should focus on last mover which means right. who is the most efficient player who will remain wo hame dekhna and the point is it can become a uh, like they were, like shubham was saying right it can become a uh, sort of ki matlab the prices keep becoming lower like their cut becomes smaller so matlab of course matlab it will always be a great business the question to ask is are you happy to buy it at 85 p that's the question one thing is uh, investment is always probabilistic that's the important point you never know what will happen tomorrow i think the very important point here is uh, what shubham mentioned government policy you look at irctc and how it crashed the moment the government announced that you know royalty uh, yeah. stocks could change overnight in a flash irctc has still not recovered that is a ps Yeah, huh. also like It's most of the subject to government policy. So is IEX. Safe returns are not enough. You have to measure risk adjusted returns. Na, safe returns does not mean anything. Risk adjusted right. returns is right. important. Right. Yeah. Uh, Sail, can I ask you something? Please, please. Uh, so you are in the IT sector, and the IT sector boom is on. So how long do you see these tailwinds propelling the sector? How long? I mean, uh, to say. that that's a wonderful question uh, let me quote some data for you uh, right Amer- america is like the most advanced country right now in the world right even in yeah. america yeah. retail is only 18% online 18% one it just imagine okay. the size of opportunity right okay. and the, it, it, everyone agrees that you know uh, software and digitization will automate everything that can be automated of course there will be some brick and mortar uh, things you have to make concrete for making uh, uh, buildings but most things that can be automated will be automated i think it digitization is a very very long term trend i don't think we are anywhere near like saturation or something like easily 10 years and in fact i would say like digital, digital growth you want to say yeah absolutely and like Uh, like one of the true mega trends right it has gone on right. for last last 20 years can go was that 19 or 20 hello <laughs> that i was am i audible yes okay i am 20 times this time okay uh, shahil hello one, one sec one sec i'm just bringing him back okay he has also gone Oh, I am back for twenty times. Thank you both of you then. Okay, okay. So <laughs> it's great. Twitter space. Sorry for that. I'm back. Okay, Sail. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah, I am also twenty times back. So running neck to neck. 
So uh, one more query for you. Why do you see all these big guys like TCS, Infosys, ACL Tech, and uh, rather smaller companies like Mastech, Nugen, Buildersoft, all these guys from uh, a digital perspective, I'm asking you. I, I, Why do you see this? Yes, essentially, one interesting thing is look at Accenture, right? That's, I think, the largest mm -hmm. IT company. The largest IT yeah. company in the world is growing at 12%. So you can ask yourself, like, right. what is the uh, play, uh, field of play for TCS? And I think there's essentially growth for everyone. All of them have their own sort of competencies. As what I've seen is a TCS cannot give that kind of attention to a thousand crore or a billion dollar uh, top line business that a Mastech or a Binasoft can, which is why there is always going to be, you know, mid-sized companies looking for mid-sized IT, large companies looking for large IT. So everyone has growth, I think. But uh, I want to know who will be the winner. Uh, can I cite uh, something? That's a great question. Uh, to be honest, I am I am I I am from Kolkata and football is very popular here. I live in Tolliganj. There was a club probably you have heard of it. Tolliganj Agrogami. Have you heard of it? No, no, no. I haven't heard of it. Tolliganj Agrogami. They were once a league champion. If you go through the I League, so this Tolliganj Agrogami is a uh, what we local club we say in Bengali we call it para club local club. So Mohan Bagan is the biggest club here. But in that particular year, Mohan Bagan was defeated thrice by Taliganj Agrogami. You got my question? No, not yet. Whether TCS will be winner or Mastic will be the winner. So uh, that's not a fair comparison, right? That's like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Mastic is a, a small ant. TCS is an elephant. The point is they're not even right. competing with each other. They're not sitting on the same table. So... No, as an investor, as an we are investing in two companies. As an investor, for me, for sure, small always beats large, always, and that's something that yeah, everyone right. will tell you that like is willing to work hard. In my humble opinion, if you if you look at Sumit Nag Sumit Nagar sir's uh, recent Bloomberg Quint interview, Sumit Nagar sir is the manager at Malabar. Someone else was also quoting Malabar. Yeah, I know, I know, I know that. So Sumit Nagar sir was quoting the same thing. Ayush Mittal, like most of the successful investors are into this, right? Because we see larger growths there, uh, for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Delhi Investors. It's a very nice session. I feel uh, this is the best Twitter space I have ever had. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dhiman. Bunk, bunk my evening clinic. Thanks. <laughs> 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 thanks. Thank you. जो लेजेंड है उनकी सिर्फ लिरिक्स के लिए लोग पागल है और जिनका दिल टूटा हुआ उनसे पूछो यार लिरिक्स नहीं नहीं, नहीं। जस्ट वो, वो तो पुराना गाना की बात है अभी जो गाना आ रहा है उसका एक ही चीज है कि आज एक पोस्ट डाला है हमने साइल उसको ट्वीट भी रीट्वीट भी किया है कुछ उसमें लिखा भी है नहीं एक्चुअली एक्सीडेंटल सर मैं बेसिकली सॉर्ट ऑफ लाइक लेट्स से एवरेज केस बोल रहा था कि लाइक फिफ्टी परसेंट सिक्सटी परसेंट लोग एक फॉर्चुनर ऐसे भी लोग हैं जो बहुत नुआंसली सुनते हैं और स्पेशली जिन गानों को हम बहुत पसंद करते हैं डेफिनेटली उनके लिरिक्स के लिए सुनते हैं आई थिंक लाइक ज्यादातर लोग उस इमोशन को भी फील करना चाहते हैं जो कि लिरिक्स कम्युनिकेट करना चाहते हैं हमारे साथ मेरा पॉइंट ये था कि हम उन गानों को बार बार विजिट करते हैं जो हमें अच्छे लगते हैं हम उनको एक बार नहीं सुनते हैं वो मेरा आई थिंक ब्रॉडर पॉइंट था हाँ Yeah, I think just to add to what Sahil said, I think um, you know what what he spoke about in the examples of the book and the movie is that you watch for content, right? I mean, you you watch to take something new out of the experience a second time that you watch it. While with music, you you come back for familiarity. So instead of like um, you know a new perspective you come back for something familiar because it takes you to a place in 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 your mind or in your heart that that you already like absolutely uh rajiv and deepak i think you all are two of my most patient listeners i mean uh, mine and sahil's most patient listeners please go ahead hi sahil hi krishna uh, thanks for hosting us and uh, <laughs> Uh, thanks again for the extensive insight on investment. Hi, sir. I have a couple of questions. 
the first one is I want to know the future of the platform business like BSC, A, MCX, IAX. And uh, the second question is uh, how do you see uh, market 2022 onward? Um. Thanks, Rajiv, sir, uh, for the question. Uh, I think like in general, platform businesses will do well for sure. But I am a bit skeptical to call these businesses as platform. I don't think they are like the highest quality of platform, to be very honest with you. So I think in India, mein kya hai ki we don't have good quality businesses. So we are going to call even IRCTC as platform, even though it's just a ticketing service. Uh, so like for sure, they will do well, like for sure. In general, if you think Indian equity market will grow, you have to agree that BSC MSC will grow. No way around it. Uh, but will I will I pay very high PE multiples for them? 50, 70, 100? Probably not because for me, the risk reward, that margin of safety is very, very important. That's your uh, first question. Uh, second question on uh, 2022 markets. Like Again, I come back to my earlier point. For an investor, I don't know like usse hume kya fark padta. it doesn't matter to us because as long as we are buying high quality businesses, agar market crash karta hai, we are getting more of what we want at cheaper prices, I'll buy more. If the market doesn't crash, it goes up, our portfolio companies will go up, we'll become richer. So actually like hamare liye it shouldn't matter too much in my humble opinion. Oh, that's very fine and thank you very, very much for the humble reply and really enriched me. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, Thanks, very much. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, where did where did Deepak go? Did we lose him? One second, no? Yeah. Uh, I think we lost him. There, there are a few speakers who are, who are there. Oh, okay, there he's come. Uh, guys, um, Guys, if you are, uh, you know, if you have raised your hand, please DM me your question so that I can pull you up. Hello. Haan, Deepak, yeah, ahead. thank you, Krishna Bhai. And hello, good evening, Sahil Bhai. Thank you for your time. So my question basically was, what is your, you know, screening process, screening, selecting and exiting any stock or company? He's coming back. He's coming back. Hello? Ah, Deepak. Yes. Yes, yes, right. So I think like essentially I would urge you to go through maybe some of my threads because he, like that's literally like you're asking me everything. Uh, but uh, a very short answer is I want to buy companies which are growing earnings at at least 25% uh, Kager at a, a valuation where that growth is not discounted, meaning people don't believe it will grow or they don't know that it will grow that fast. The quality of growth is good, uh, highly deterministic competitive advantages, ye sab company mein, which is why I might study 100 companies, then invest in two. Like, I'm not going to jump on every bandwagon or attend every party. And for, for selling, I think most important thing, and this is something which like many investors that I respect a lot have said, most important is you must know what to do with that money when you sell that company. For example, when I sold, let's say, uh, Polymedicure, I had some other opportunity lined up, maybe Mastec at 15 p.m. And that made sense. So I invested in Mastec. Polymedicure at 80, Mastec at 15, Mastec made more sense to me. So I invested. But the point is we should know what we'll do with that money. Hum, Sell karke, we should not just sit on that money. Otherwise, it's not earning, you know, uh, future returns. Okay, okay, got it. And if I can chip in one more question, if is it possible, Krishna Bhai? Sure, sure. Sahil, yeah. uh, it's cool, right? Yeah, please, please, please. Yeah. yeah, so let's take our government target is, you know, to 5 trillion op- uh, uh, this a market you know, GDP by 25, 2025 or let's say by 2028 itself. 
so we have next 8 years to you know achieve the 5 trillion uh, gdp so if we compare to developed country you know most of the discretionary spend goes toward the uh, uh, like qsr or streaming kind of leisure activity so what's your take on this so which which can be a big beneficiary let's say after 5 years which can be a winner industry or theme uh thanks deepak sir i think that's a wonderful question uh def be great things because someone else is also seeing government policy really important right uh they are actually the fascinating thing for me is almost every sector has a pli now it's hard to find a sector which does not have pli now a production linked incentive scheme so i would say like you know we should try to find sectors where india will be competitive there are many of them right for example m- medical devices apis chemicals but i think the one that is very exciting to me now is actually you know semiconductors and electronics because government has said they will give i think 10 billion dollar or so of tax breaks over the next 5 years and actually this is if you read about it like chip design chip manufacturing extremely hard like extremely power 500 hard bahut hard hai anything that we can do here i think it will be like uh, really really big multi bagger so we have to like you know put our heads down read a lot figure out ki kya chal raha hai company actually has advantages or not you know competitive advantages okay got it got thank you so much thank you yeah cool just just a heads up uh, that we will be closing the space um in the next Eight minutes. Uh, also, uh, Fatehpur, bro. Uh, j- before we go, uh, I think let's make sure that everyone who hasn't spoken gets a chance to speak. So, um, Achin Bansal is still not spoken. Uh, Achin, go ahead, and th- then uh, Fatehpur will come back to you. Hi, Sahil. Thanks for the uh, great uh, introduction. Hi, and thanks, Krishna, for hosting this. Uh, Sahil, since you are from the domain, I wanted to ask you about uh, tech product companies, and there are a few listed ones uh, like NewGen or Intellect Design. Do you think uh, among the listed ones or the smaller ones, the uh, Indian market has any opportunities uh, in the tech product space which are worthwhile? I mean, so obviously I- there are the big tech giants abroad, uh, but from the Indian space. Yeah, actually, my main worry with these companies uh, is that uh, you know selling a product is very very different ball game than IT services or SaaS or SaaS or you know like these other uh, uh, digitization plays. The problem is with a product, you are putting upfront investment and then you have to sell it to everyone, right? You need a sales, marketing, and you have to sit on that table, win against them, uh, and the, the the investments are upfront. The rewards are back ended. there is a small element of risk there and we have to really understand the company and its products i have tried very hard to read intellect design arena i don't understand their product very well because i'm not a banker so for me it goes into the too hard bucket because i don't have to attend every party in town right and also when i listen to their con call they say we can grow our earnings at 20% so i ask myself you know uh, intellect design arena 20% earnings growth and i don't understand it versus mastic 26% versus lorus also 26% like why would i you know want to go for intellect when i don't even understand it okay fair enough cool we have uh, we have rakesh who's who's left to speak um, fadepur we are coming to you we are coming to you just want to make sure everybody gets a chance to speak yeah thank you sahil and uh, thank you krishna for the opportunity uh, and thanks to sahil sahil i have been uh, following your uh, tweets and the posts in the value picker you have literally you know added lot of value to the investor community the youngsters who have started investing and uh, the kind of insight that you provide had been really phenomenal i mean uh, at times you know i sometimes replied to you 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 know very quickly had re- responded also just you know i i wanted to take a, one or two views about two specific industry i i was just a bit late to join this space i'm really sorry for that 
uh, we we had a phenomenal run in the specialty chemical space uh, and obviously you know there had been margin contraction because of the inflationary pressure on raw materials now going going forward most of the specialty chemical company they have said that you know they do have some kind of price transfer mechanism through which they can you know transfer this some of this uh, hike of the raw material prices to the uh, final buyer so where do you see the specialty chemicals like if really they can pass on some of this price hike in the raw material in the coming quarters because i see that many of the specialty chemicals has been beaten beaten down they have corrected around 30% even if the index is corrected by 10% they are being already corrected by 30 40% sometimes uh, so just wanted to have your view on that that is one thing second thing is how do you see uh, the opportunity in thyro care when when it has been acquired by pharmacy because they have a you know super uh, digital reach and uh, how do you see that this business can pan out in the near future these are the basically two questions to you sahil if you can answer yeah rakesh sir thank you so much for the questions and thank you for like patiently you know listening uh, on the question of specialty chemical i think really important for us to figure out the value chain and the actual specialty part of each and every company that we care about because a lot of these companies that we claim as specialty their majority of revenue is still from commodity so they are not specialty actually like they are more specialty mm-hmm. in the narrative not in the numbers mm-hmm. so that is very important mm-hmm. if you look at companies like tatva chintan companies mm-hmm. like clean science they are truly 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 mm-hmm. very specialty i mean clean science i think at a global level they have very high market share so for them it will be very easy right. to pass on but for mm-hmm. other companies okay. which are more okay. of like commoditized it will be very hard so we have to see it you know on a case by case basis we have to see the past ki pehle jab hua tha were they able to pass on or not and from that we can judge thoda unka con call wagera pad ke you know looking at the older ones um, your, your second question can you just tell once more what it was about Thyro it was care, about right? the recent takeover. Uh, it was yeah about thyro care, right? Yeah. So actually, thyro care. I did study a little bit. My understanding was that the big risk is that we don't know how pharmacy will treat the minority investors. They have acquired large part. Now, how will they treat us? What will they do? We don't know. I think for me, for a retail investor, it's just a very like. uncomfortable situation at least for me because mujhe nahi pata hai what they want to do they want to maximize value for their private equity investor they don't care about the small investor in thyro care or rather let me put it this way that is not like at the top of their mind right they are thinking about their private equity investor mm-hmm. so i would say ki why when at least for me personally i would not want to get into these complicated kind of things uh if i am i would want mm-hmm. to be very careful like dhyan se dekhna hai very very carefully we have to watch everything Hmm. Okay, thank you, Sahil. I won't take much time. It's been already a you know long, long time of discussion. I mean, th- really, thanks to you, heartfelt thanks to you. Thanks, thank sir. Krishna, thank thank you. you. Thank you so much. I think we can take the last one from Fatehpur and then close. Yeah, Sahil, how do you like uh, get some analysis of Tejas network? Like it is creating the five G related hardware, software for for hardy. I think that hardware. So I was hearing like one guy who previously worked in that company. They were saying that Tata go just like that. That you decide the price, I will pay. They get get something like that. And also the problem was that they have a lot of 5G software, but because they don't have like popular name, so they were not able to sell. So people were saying that they have already built in all the system. Only they need name, which is Tata now. So that uh, i was thinking ki how it is opportunity actually like to be honest with you i haven't studied it very deeply so like i don't know about it i don't think in charge cool guys uh, i think uh, with that let's let's uh, wrap up it's been 3 hours and it's been a fantastic session with sail i just want to uh, thank sail for um no no for all the you know um, time and energy that he de- uh, that he dedicated to this session um you know answering all of your questions hanging out here 
it's been phenomenal to have uh, sail you as a guest it's been great chatting with you and i look forward to you know more interactions and uh, hopefully meeting in person as well when i come down to delhi yeah definitely krishna and you know thank you so much everyone that is still here and that's i think uh, 215 people i mean i'm amazed uh, like so many people are still there thank you so much for listening uh, very very thoughtful questions uh, it was amazing uh, you're doing great work krishna and I, yes i would also love to meet you whenever you are in delhi thank you so much i just also want to uh, give a big shout out to one recording space and investment books who uh, have been you know here since the beginning they are our recording partners and uh, they'll be putting out the recording to the space uh, soon on on their youtube channels so again a big ha- uh, thanks to both of you for coming out and and supporting me and dia in everything that we do uh, it's been uh, it's been really amazing thank you thank you thank you everyone